It's the Mixed Martial Arts Hour with... Mixed Martial Arts Hour is back in your life on this Wednesday, August 16, 2023. Hello again, everyone. I sure hope you're doing well, and yes, that is correct. I am not in our New York City studio. I am over there. Yes, here I am. Hello. Hello, everyone. Back in the familiar home studio, you know this spot, the books, the setup. I have to be home today because I am leaving on a jet plane in just a few hours. And, you know, the old days, you would say like, oh, you're leaving on a jet plane in just a few hours. You can't do the show. Here I am getting the show in one last pump of the iron if you will because i don't like to leave you hanging not on a pay-per-view fight week i mean ufc 292 in boston mass and yes we are live it is uh 101 p.m on this wednesday august 16th i guess i could have faked that as well but no it's it's really 101 i'm not really sure how to prove i don't have a newspaper in front of me but uh trust me it's 101 p.m eastern time On Wednesday, August 16th, and so we have a lot to discuss on this Wednesday, and as always, we are presented by our good friends over at DraftKings Sportsbook. They are the official sports betting partner of not only this program, but the UFC as well. Please download the DraftKings Sportsbook app today, and do use the code, the MMA Hour, if you're a first-time user. That lets them know we sent you, and you get a nice little gift off the bat. So thank you very much to DraftKings. Back into the show uh, we'll make our picks. Actually, more like the middle of the show, the Parlay Boys plus Juliana Pena will make their picks for 292. We'll get GC's picks as well. We're talking a lot of 292, obviously, on today's show. What a fantastic card it is. Two title fights, of course. Aljamain Sterling, Sean O'Malley at the top of the bill. Um, at around 2.30 Eastern time, we'll be joined by Demetrius Johnson, who has been in the news as of late and also just celebrated his 37th birthday. So shout out to the flyweight goat, Demetrius Johnson, who I always love having on the program. Prior to that, we'll make the picks, get GC's picks. Prior to that, we'll be joined by Mr. Red Hawk himself, Tim Welch, the head coach for one Sugar Sean O'Malley. Big spot for him, first title fight for him. Uh, He does great stuff on YouTube, on his Patreon, with Sean, by himself. We had him on a couple of months ago, but I thought it would be fun to check in with him just three days away from their first big title fight together. That tandem has done very big things together. Uh, prior to that, we'll be joined by Shane Burgos, who's returning to action next Wednesday against Clay Collard in the second leg of the NYC PFL playoffs. They've got their first leg this Friday. Uh, Shane obviously kind of got in via a very interesting little scenario, if you will. Remember the whole Natan Schulte, Hausch Manfio fight that PFL determined wasn't a real fight, and so they punished Schulte and took him out of the playoffs, and in entered Shane Burgos. A crazy situation, if we ever saw one. And so he benefited from that, and we'll talk to him about that whole situation and more. Like I said, UFC 292 is going to be tremendous theater. The TD Garden events are always great. The crowds are always great. Top of the bill, you have Sterling O'Malley, plus with this new storyline, is uh, Aljamain going to leave the bantamweight division if he wins on Saturday and vacate that title, or at least bring it up with him for a champ-champ fight, as he put it. Uh, Zhang Wei Li returning against Amanda Lemos. Ian Gary, who is carrying the card, as he put it, against Neil Magny, who took this fight on short notice. You got the return of Cheeto Vera uh, in a big fight against Pedro Munoz. Cheeto looking to get back on track after the disappointing loss to Corey Sanhagen. The return of Chris Weidman, who we have not seen in two and a half years, going up against Brad Tavares. Another fight that is uh, flying under the radar that I'm looking forward to is Gerald Mearshart against Andre Petrosky. And for the first time on this program, uh, we have the pleasure of welcoming in one Andre Petrosky, who, of course, is in Boston right now, getting ready for UFC 292, his first fight of 2023. Let us say hello to him right now. Andre, my man, how are you? Thanks for joining us. Doing really good. Thanks, Ariel. Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's a pleasure. And, uh, you know, we we were very close to having you on uh, for the first time many, many moons ago. You were almost immortalized 
on our wall before ever coming on the show, which is a very rare feat. You were that close to making it happen in Abu Dhabi. Sean Brady was trying to make it happen, but as the kids like to say, I think I think you may have fumbled the bag. I don't know. Do you, are, are you were you even aware that all of this was going on? You walking out to the song and getting on the wall. I mean, this was a big spot. I thought. Yeah, so I I went down to uh, the UFC guys and I was like, this is the song I want to come out to. And they said John DeRobi already took the song. (laughs) And I was like, well, I fight before her. I don't care. We can both come out to the same song. And they wouldn't they wouldn't let me do it. So it wasn't meant to be Ariel. Okay, so this was during the uh, the the Island Boy craze. And uh, you're telling me that you actually went to the UFC and asked them to have that song first, but because she beat you to the proverbial punch, that's why she is now immortalized for life. On You were that close to having your mug on our wall forever. It was Virna Janjiroba that robbed you of this moment. Is that what you're saying? A day late and a dollar short. Golly, that's tough. All right, well, we'll figure out something else because I feel like the intentions were there. And uh, now I kind of feel bad for, for you know, holding this against you. Um, nevertheless, great to have you on. <laughs> Big fight for you. By the way, uh, the hair situation, what is going on with the cheetah print on your on your head? I've seen this photo. It's, what is, it's leopard. What is this? Oh, leopard. My, my apologies. My apologies. Yeah, what, yeah. what is the inspiration here? Well, leopard, leopards are very fast, and I have a, a, a distinct speed advantage in this matchup. Okay. Is uh, correct me if I'm wrong. First time you've done this before. The cheetah or the leopard? The leopard. I don't know. The leopard or the <laughs> cheetah. Have you ever done this? <laughs> correct. Correct. Yeah. Uh, what inspired this? I don't know. I just wanted to do something different. I like. Uh, I went blonde before. I mean, that's a little played out. Everyone's, everyone and their mothers going blonde these days. So uh, I went with the cheetah. I like it. By the way, how long did that take? Oh, it took forever, like four hours because they had to do three different colors. So they dyed it, uh, the blonde, the platinum first, and then they did the yellow, which was a different color. And then they did the black and then they cut my oh, hair. God. Oh, my God. Yeah. You didn't get restless in the chair for all that time. Oh, my God. I'm the I can't sit still. I'm the worst. Yeah. Will you do it again or is it one and done for you? Well, I guess we'll see how it pans out, huh? Okay, it depends on the result. <laughs> right, right. Okay, uh, so you mentioned that you, you have the speed advantage uh, against Gerald. When you were approached about fighting Gerald, he's been around the block, has had some some big wins, some great submissions as well. Did you like this matchup for you? Given where you're at in the UFC, undefeated, uh, you've won you know all your fights in impressive fashion, I would say, uh, four in a row since coming into the UFC. Did you feel like this was a good, proper next step for you? Were you looking for a bigger name? What were your thoughts? So I asked for the Mir Shark fight um, after I beat Maximov. So, um, yeah, I was thrilled. I, I, I was really excited about the matchup. I originally liked it because he has the most submissions in the history of the division. And I continue to make the same argument that you know, I'm the best grappler in the division. So knocking off the guy with the most submissions for further uh, cements my argument. Does the winner of this fight have to win via submission? Is there like a gentleman's agreement here between you guys? I feel like that's the only way that this could be truly settled. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. Okay. Uh, very interesting. I like that. Uh, we, we did see you. Um, I said, this is your first fight of 2023. You did compete in a uh, fury pro grappling. Didn't go your way. Obviously tough night ankle lock. Did that kill? I feel like those kill. How did, how did you feel about that? It's like a part of jujitsu that um, I wish I had more time to focus on and do like the pure jujitsu stuff. But, you know, with MMA, a lot of it doesn't really apply. So that the jujitsu guys, uh, they, you know, they, they don't have to spend as much time working on striking and, and all the other stuff. So um, I hate to give an excuse for why I lost, but yeah, that was it. Okay. And you were supposed to fight in early May and had to withdraw that, that Sterling Cejudo fight. What happened there? So I tore my rotator cuff. Um, yeah, but the UFC helped me a lot. I didn't end up needing surgery. Uh, I got stem cells and I did like six weeks of rehab and, um, yeah, luckily it's been good ever since. I thought, uh, you wanted to attend Sean Brady's wedding. That's why you couldn't fight that weekend. (laughs) 
Um, unfortunately, no. No. Did you attend the wedding? I did not. Oh, well, you didn't get you didn't get invited. Aren't you boys? <laughs> I forget what I had that weekend. Okay. Now this I wish just I had got a better story maybe, for you, Ariel. <laughs> maybe you're not boys. Did I did I screw up? Did something happen here? Did I am I did I just make this awkward? No, nah, I mean we're teammates. I just I I couldn't make it. He didn't invite you. Okay. Don't don't worry. He didn't invite me either. He didn't invite me. He didn't invite me either. I, was, so I, it's... I, I didn't make the cut. Okay, I didn't make the cut either. Just for, I, I was feeling Pfeiffer bad, so I'm happy. Cut. I didn't make the cut. He left Pfeiffer me for made... Pfeiffer. Okay, here's the wow. details. He left me for Pfeiffer. Wow. Yeah. That's messed up. Pfeiffer made the it, cut. It all comes out now. Oh, my gosh. All right. Um, around that same time, though, uh, you, you posted something on your Instagram. And honestly, I never knew about this, but you, you tagged me in it, uh, which is one, one of the main things that I wanted to talk to you about today. Uh, this was back on May 5th. Uh, just a quick recap of what you wrote. You said that your buddy, uh, Bobby Baldwin, called you yesterday. Five years ago, a judge gave me the option of going to get help instead of sitting in a jail cell, dope sick. And so they took me to a treatment center where Bobby did my intake. I was 168 pounds and a sad excuse of a human being. I didn't know many junkies who were able to stop, let alone fighters. The reality that I would likely spend the rest of my life an addict was starting to become more and more evident. I remember listening to Jared Gordon's story on Ariel Hawani's show and it giving me hope. That is why I feel it is my obligation to share a period of my life I'm ashamed of. I want to thank my beautiful mother for showing me what unconditional love is and the countless people who told me about the importance of a relationship with God. I am blessed that God removed the obsession from my life and gave me the ability to pursue my dreams. I can honestly say that I prayed for the life I live today. Today, my parents are proud of me. Yesterday, my daughter told me she wanted to be like me when she grows up. How dare I not be grateful? Uh, that, that is an incredible post and congratulations on, on five years. Uh, when, when you heard that story from Jared, I've talked to Jared a bit over the years about, you know, his, his ups and downs and trials and tribulations. Where were you at in your life when, when he, when he spoke about that on the show? I was, a uh, I was still an amateur and I was getting high and I, I like was really, I didn't want to get high anymore. Like I was done with it. It, it wasn't alluring at all. And, and I was really in a bad spot and I just didn't know how to stop. And, it was just getting worse and worse. And when then I, you, I, I would listen to your podcast a lot. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, when yeah. were you first introduced to drugs? Uh, man, when I was like a kid, um, like maybe 15 or 16, I had this neighbor and uh, his mom would just give us like Oxy 80s when we were, when I was a kid and I would, wow. I tried it and loved it. And uh, you know, Throughout high school, I would like, you know, if you're cutting weight and you can't, you know, all your friends are going out drinking and, you know, you can't drink. That was kind of like my outlet at the time. And, uh, yeah, it just progressed worse and worse. I, yeah, it just got worse and worse and then eventually turned into heroin, as with a lot of people from this area. Even, you know, you, you were a D1 wrestler. You're competing at the highest level in college. Even then, are you are you using drugs? So uh, there was times where I was able to stop and I would go away and, and get a, get out of, you know, Philadelphia and the area. And I, I did have uh, some times when stuff was good, but every time I came back, I would just slip back into the same, the same stuff, you know? What, what was rock bottom for you? So rock bottom was, um, I was like trying my last, at this point I was in, in real bad shape. Uh, I was like a bundle a day, just real bad shape. And I, I still fought. I did a kickboxing fight. And uh, this that was my last amateur fight. And I tried. I went home and I, I tried to kick at home. And I made it like three days. And I just couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. I was so sick. And I ended up going and getting high with this kid. And uh, I overdosed and on the way back. Um, I was coming back from Kensington and I overdosed. So he called the paramedics. and. Uh, he pulled over somewhere like off 95. It was, it was in Ridley. And uh, when I came to, I like freaked out. I panicked and freaked out and I tried to run and I, I was in no shape to run, obviously. So I ended up get I, I was tased. I pissed myself and then they ended up taking me that I was arrested and I was taken to jail. Uh, I actually wasn't taken to jail. I was taken to the station and 
that was where like I got real sick. Like within like 24 hours, I, I was in bad shape, but within 24 hours, I was like, you know, shit myself, begging the guard for toilet paper. Like that was my rock bottom. And, and uh, <clears throat> like I, I, at this point, like I really had no, no belief in God or anything. And, and I got on my knees in the cell and, you know, threw up like the Hail Mary foxhole prayer, uh, like the desperation. And that, that's what God means to me is like that gift of desperation. And um, I said, you know, like, God, if, if you help me, help me here, like, you know, I'll never abandon you, blah, blah, blah. And um, yeah, my life has gotten just tremendously better ever since I went to a treatment facility. Um, I went to Malvern and I went through the whole program. Uh, I lived in a recovery house. Yeah. And then about when I was about a year uh, sober, my I, I my daughter's mother was pregnant and uh, I went to court and uh, for all the charge, I had a bunch of charges and I went to court and the district attorney was like, oh, so at this point, so this allowed me to get sober and turn pro. So when I was getting high, I couldn't I didn't want to fail a drug test. I was afraid to go pro. So I went pro. And when I when I went to court, the district attorney was like, hey, he pulled me aside. He's like, hey, I just want you to know, like, I, I watched your fight and like, I'm really rooting for you. And they wow. I pleaded guilty to disorderly conduct. They dropped all the charges. Yeah, I was I was really worried because I thought I was going to have no license and be on probation, go to jail and then not be able to see my daughter. And uh, my daughter was born and, and that changed me like that. That <clears throat> I mean, that totally changed me for sure. Like that was that was a big pivot in my life I, I i was just you know a selfish person like a real selfish piece of shit and uh my daughter continues to change me changes me every day gives me the chills uh, but yeah she's four now and uh man like i i know it sounds corny but like the life that i live today like i prayed for everything like i never th i prayed to be sober one day and then i prayed that one day i would uh you know, one day I'd be able to not have to work and I'd have to, uh, I'd be able to just train and pursue my career. And that was like a big day for me when I didn't have to go to work anymore. Like there was a time when my daughter was, was a baby and I worked seven days a week during camp getting ready for a fight. And, um, yeah, like my life's just great to be four and in the UFC and have the opportunity to fight, you know, the guy with the most submissions in the division's history, and me to continue to make this argument that I'm the best grappler in this division. Like I'm so lucky, man. Holy shit. What a life, man. What a, what a, what a story. Thank you for sharing. Just, I mean, I, I know that's just probably 0.5% of everything that you've been through that, that day that you were in the, the cell, if you will, and, and asking the, the guard for toilet paper, and things like that, how long ago is that? How many years ago is that? That was the day before five years ago from that day I made that post. So it was, uh, May 2nd. Wow. Wow. Is that the, is that the last time you ever took any kind of drugs? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I've been straight and, and ever since. I can't even imagine what's that like. And, and so you're begging him for help and are they just ignoring you? No, he would come and then he would say, Oh, well, yeah. And then the one time he was like, uh, the judge is coming in in a couple hours. You'll be fine. And I was like, dude, <laughs> Do you, th in that moment, do you think you're going to die? I wanted to die. <laughs> you just wanted to end it all. <clears throat> I mean, I was just fighting. Like <laughs> I was suffering bad. That was my rock bottom. That was my lowest yeah. point for sure. Could you even imagine all of this? Could you imagine UFC? Could you imagine success? Or was that so far fetched at that point? Like, was it, was there any sort of glimmer of hope? <laughs> Like I said, you know, I, I heard Jared Gordon go through it. Um, and I heard a, um, a couple other people, like there was like one or two other people that I've heard their stories too, but Jared was the big one that, that gave me hope. But now, I mean, it, it, I, look, the reality is most IV drug user, IV heroin addicts, you know, life expectancy is about 26 years old, you know? So I, I didn't have, like, it was tough, man. And it was getting worse and worse. Like it, 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 my mentality at the time, like in the beginning was like, oh, I'll stop tomorrow. I'll stop tomorrow. I'll stop tomorrow. And then it was like, oh, I can manage this. Like I, I can manage this. Like I was still winning fights surprisingly. And then like, you know, when you're overdosing in jail, it, you're not managing anything. Like, right. 
So yeah, it just got worse and worse. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming, I, I, th- I think you have a relationship with Jared, right? You, you've told him this. Do you, do you remember like the first time you reached out to him and, and told him what his story did for you? Yeah, I told him when I was still getting high. I said, hey, like I heard your story and I'm struggling right now. Like um, I just, you know, I appreciated it wherever. And he was able to steer me in the right direction. And, you know, wow. unfortunately it took uh, a catastrophic event to to really force me to, get into the treatment center and make those serious changes to my life. Um, yeah, but he, he was, he definitely gave me a lot of advice at the time that was, that was helpful. I, I appreciate the fact that like you tell the story now and we just kind of listen to it and, and digest it and move on. But I can't imagine early on how hard it is to just cut all that out of your life. Were there ever moments where you were afraid that you would, you know, you you would you would go back to it and and how did you fight those urges yeah that's a good question um so the gym i'm at now i'm with i'm in kensington my, my mark has mma where i do my sparring is in kensington and uh we we moved locations but before we were right under the l and um i remember the first day i went there because me and joey were at a different team before we went to before we came to henzo gracie philly we were with balance. And I remember the first day I went to that gym, I was in Kensington and I popped my rib out in the middle. Of, and the first day there, I popped my rib out, I was in the middle of practice. And, uh, like I couldn't breathe. Like it was, it was bad. And, uh, I walked outside and I got in my car and there I am in my car, like in excruciating pain, sitting in the middle of Kensington. And I'm like three, four, three, four months sober at this time. You know what I mean? Like in a bad spot. And I was like, man, like, and and I actually didn't go back to that gym for a couple months after that. I was like, man, I just, that's not, I was scared. You know what I mean? Like I was scared of, mm-hmm. and luckily, like, you know, I, I said some prayers and I got out of there, but I just remember that being like a pivotal moment where I was like, <clears throat> I feel like a lot of people may, may have turned back at that point and God, God had different plans. For- you know, I, I, uh, I've been lucky to do a lot of things uh, in my career covering the sport. One of the, uh, experiences that has stuck with me that I'll never ever forget is spending a day in Kensington with Eddie Alvarez. I don't know if you've ever seen this interview, but we walked around the neighborhood and you know, I, I've never been to a place like that before. And I'll never forget seeing syringes. I know exactly what you're talking about. I know exactly the L train, you know, underpass. We walked through that. He took me on a tour. He showed me his house. Um, unfortunately, like you would see people who would we're walking up and down the street who look like zombies. And so I can visualize everything that you're talking about here. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's a heartbreaking experience to just like pop in there and, and, and see that. And it's, you know, in a major metropolitan city and then p- to pop out. And so, um, I know I, I can understand exactly what you're talking about when you describe this. And so now do you, you still live in Kensington? No, I live in New Jersey now, but I okay. still go to Kensington for practice. And, my perspective on it now is that I think it's good for me because I see where it ends. You know, I'm not seeing the allure of taking a Percocet. Like, that's not what I'm seeing. I'm seeing where it ends and where it ends is looking like a zombie in Kensington. And that's a reminder to me of how easily, you know, how lucky I am for one and, and how easily I could lose everything. Wow. So you see that almost every day, like you, you are putting yourself right back into that blender almost every day. Yeah. Well, three days That's a week, intense. two days a week. Okay. Three days a week. But like some would say I, I would want nothing to do with those, those images and, and, and that setting you're going right back into the belly of the beast. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's a, a little bit surprising. I, I understand what you're saying. Uh, I can understand also someone who's saying like, I would want to go somewhere completely different. So I don't have to see this anymore. Like, so I could just cleanse myself of all this. I mean, I did that for a while, but I'm, I'm five, I'm over five years removed from heroin. Like I I know where it took me. Um, yeah, this is where I need to be right now. You know what I mean? I I have a big, I have the ability to make us like, a big impact on the sport and, and in MMA in the Philadelphia area. I talk about it all the time. Like I'm so proud to be part of this 
first wave of Philly fighters that stayed here and build uh, build a team in Philadelphia. You know, like the the early guys like Paul and Eddie, those guys, they're the best. But they all left. You know, they went to Milwaukee or they went to Florida. Um, so like. For the first time ever, you're seeing these guys come to Philadelphia to pursue a career in martial arts. Like that's not you never heard of that before. You know, we have we just had Nurse Latan. Uh he came from Uzbekistan. Like we have all these Eastern European fighters coming because they heard like our coaches and our team is the best team in the UFC. And our record speaks for it, you know. I'm four and oh, Joey's two and oh, Jeremiah's four and one, Pat's four and one, Sean Brady's five and one. Like our team has the best record and, and mm. I'm proud to say that like I was a part of that group of fighters that said, no, I'm going to stay here and be with my daughter, be with my family, not leave my family. And I'm just going to build here. And we built what something special. Say, 100%. You guys are on an immense uh, role right now. What would you say to uh, an Andre Petrosky who is watching the Jared Gordon interview right now, hearing about your story, you five years ago watching this, and someone who is watching this right now, who feels like they're in a rut, who feels like there is no light, who has skills, who has potential, who has the ability, but can't get out of his way. What would you say to that person perhaps watching this right now? So for me, it was, I always thought that like, you know, I can, I can fix this. Like I'll stop. I can do this. Like I don't, and it was always like, I don't need help. Like I can do this myself. And that, that type of mentality made me very successful in fighting and wrestling, like complete ownership. Right. But that's not the case that like drugs was the first thing where it didn't matter how tough I was. Like I wasn't, I needed help. Like I needed someone to help me. Like I needed to go to a treatment facility and I needed someone to sit me down and be like, yo, like you don't know what the fuck you're doing. Like sit down and be like, yo, just follow me. Listen to what I tell you to do. Like, that's what I needed. I needed someone to help me. Someone who had significant amount of, of time away from drugs and, and knew what they were talking about. Big fight on Saturday, big stage. Uh, you, you've, you've called out the likes of Bo Nickel. Do you, do you still want that fight or after Gerald? And especially if you sub him, are you looking elsewhere? Uh, if Bo Nickel thinks that he's the best grappler in the division, I'm more than willing and I'm more than willing. Yeah, especially okay. end of the year. There's they're coming to the East Coast twice. I'm here. I'm ready. Absolutely. That's the fight. You you think you think the UFC wants that? If you submit Gerald Mearshart on Saturday, you think the UFC wants to make that fight? Absolutely. You can't look, everyone's sitting here saying nobody wants to fight Bo Nickel. Nobody wants to fight no Bo Nickel. And I'm sitting here and saying, what are you talking about? I'm continuing to ask for Bo Nickel. I want Bo Nickel. Do you think Bo wants that fight? It seems to me like he does not. He's turned it down twice now. And when you say turned it down, what does that mean? Did the UFC offer well, both, him you? Sorry, sorry. Both was for Fury Grappling. So originally okay. his manager reached out for Fury Grappling. And I said, look, I didn't think he was going to fight me at two and oh, three and oh. Right. But I was like, maybe, uh, why wouldn't he want to do a grappling match? So we presented my name for him. His manager, no, no response. And then I actually uh, posted a picture of his coach or something. And he messaged me, what are you talking about? Blah, blah. I said, look, if you want to grapple, we can do the Fury card, no leg locks agreement. You won't get hurt. You don't have to worry about getting hurt. He's like, bro, no one's worrying about you hurting me, blah, blah. Uh, you got to – he's like, I'm not fighting – I'm not competing for peanuts. And I said, that's fair. He's like, I'm not Dan Hodge trophy winner. I'm not competing for peanuts. I said, that's more than fair. Tell me exactly what you want, and I'll make sure you get it. And I'll make sure it's more than you just made in your contender series fight. I can guarantee you get more than the contender series fight. His response was, well, you got to reach out to my manager then. Hmm. All right. Well, let's see what happens. So there it is. Uh, for now, uh, not important. Big fight against Gerald Mearshart. Really appreciate you coming on, Andre, and, and, and telling us a little bit about your story. All the best. I, there's a part of me that wants to apologize for not having you on sooner uh, because your story is incredibly inspirational and, and you've been on an incredible role. Shout out to Kayla Harrison for uh, making the pitch. I don't, I don't know. You know, she just came out of nowhere. She's like, you got to get my guy Andre on. And so 
If Kayla tells me to do something, I do it. And I'm so glad that she did that. So good luck to you this Saturday. Uh, really appreciate the time and can't wait to see you back in there this, uh, this weekend at UFC 292. Yeah. Thank you, Ariel. And thank you, Kayla, for uh, making the introduction. Awesome stuff. All right. Thank you, Andre. All the best to you. What a, what a great story. What an inspirational story. Uh, unbelievable. I remember that time that Jared Gordon was on the program telling us about his, his, his inspirational story. And to think that now someone was watching that and that helped turn his life around to the point where he is now one of the rising stars in the UFC, certainly at 185, 4 and 0 in the UFC, beat Michael Gilmore uh, back in 2021, August of 2021, almost exactly two years ago. Uh, then followed that up with another submission win. The Nick Maximov win, I think, was a big one where he did that in, uh, what was that, 76 seconds back in May of 2022. Had a nice win in. Uh, Madison Square Garden, New York City, back in November, was supposed to fight in May, as I said, and now getting Gerald Mearshart. Uh, this is probably the the highest profile fight of his uh, young UFC career, so I'm really looking forward to that one as well. Um, next week, not this weekend, this Friday, uh, PFL is back in New York City. Uh, next week, though, we have the return of Shane Burgos. Uh, he is going up against Clay Collard in a very fun playoff fight. And obviously, uh, last time we saw him in action, he had a win that was in late June. All kinds of drama surrounding that fight. Hurricane Shane, kind enough to join us right now on the program. Let us say hello to Shane Burgos. Hello, Shane. How are you? How's it going, bro? I'm good. Uh, great to have you back on. Uh, congrats on picking up your first PFL win uh, back in, in June. There was a lot of drama surrounding that win. Nothing that any, like, had to do with you, but holy smokes. Yeah. Did, did you feel like all that stuff took away from the performance, took away from the fight. I mean, it literally had nothing to do. You benefited from it, but it, you know, it, it really had nothing to do with your actions. How did you feel about the aftermath of it all? Yeah. So it was definitely, it was weird, man. Like I, I won the fight and I was like, obviously happy you win the fight. Cause at the end of the day, winning the fight is the most important thing. So happy I won the fight, but I was like, damn, I'm bummed out. And I'm obviously out of the, out of the fucking playoffs. So that, that sucked. Um, I get, but I didn't even actually go to sleep. So I, I was having my, my third daughter, she was due any day now so i had to get my ass back home so i got on a plane at like 5 a.m that morning didn't even go to sleep i land and then my pt i get obviously no service he's like shane I'm like what's up he said a couple rows back he's like did you did you, did you check your phone i'm like no nah, i have no service he's like check your phone i'm like I'm trying he's like you catch he throws me his phone and i'm like what the fuck? all right this is obviously fake i'm looking and i'm like oh shit mma fighting post i'm like what the fuck? I'm like, and then my phone, then I get service and I see just blowing up. I'm like, holy shit, what is going, what is going on? Completely wow. took me by surprise. What a wonderful experience. Yeah. So you had no idea when you were in Atlanta, when you were at the arena, at any point, even uh, after the, like you, you landed right, back honest, home thinking that you were out. Yes. Honest to God. I know people think that I thought that I knew about it beforehand. Honest to God. I had no clue. I even told my wife, I was like, I'm so bummed. I was like, but you know, we're having the baby. At least I'll be able to just focus on just being a dad for the next couple of months. Like we'll be able to just put focus on that. I land and I, I, I send her that right away. I'm like, remember everything I said last night? Never mind. I'm back in. So um, during that brief period, a few hours where you actually thought that your, your first year with PFL would, you know, last those two fights and you were out. How are you feeling? Like this, this has been some, you know, we've seen this with, with Pettis and, yeah. and worry where the, the UFC star comes over and doesn't quite, you know, live up to the hype or whatever. How were you feeling about what you had done and how it was all ending, at least for that moment? So I was obviously bummed not making it to the playoffs, but I was happy that I won the fight. But then it was also like, a, I was like, you know what? Maybe I'll be able to get like a one-off fight in the finale. And so I was like, I knew my, I know my year's not done. I was like, I'm obviously not going to be fighting in August, but that finale card, I think they'll, they'll want to put me on it, especially if they put it in New York like they did the last couple of years. So I was like, I'm just going to focus on that and and then stay as optimistic as I can. I mean, obviously I'm coming off a win, so it's easier to be optimistic than when you're coming off a loss. So it was definitely a, it was a bittersweet feeling. And then, um, but being in, even in this position is kind of like a bittersweet because it's not, not I, I don't know if I don't feel called bittersweet. It's definitely sweet being where I'm at, but uh, with, like you said, with all that controversy like that, I had nothing to do with. It kind of is like, uh, puts me in a weird position where everyone's like, oh, he's, he's not even supposed to be there and he's there. And like, it, people think they're playing favoritism or anything like that. Like, and I keep using this uh, scenario, like had my last opponent, Yamato, had he knocked me the fuck out in the third round, he still wouldn't have an, had enough points 
right? Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. you don't think the PFL would have gave him the opportunity had he knocked Shane mm-hmm. Burgos out like out cold in the third round? And they, I think, I think no matter if it was me or if it was him winning, they they would have done what they did. Uh, that performance against Yamato, how did you feel about it? How did you feel about what you did in there? You got the win, decision yeah. win. How did you feel about your performance? I'm pissed I didn't, I didn't get the finish on him, but it was it was such a weird fight. It was really really weird fight. Uh, the kid's super tough, man. He's got a chin and a half. I hit him with some hard shots with, with, with the ground and I was surprised he didn't go out honestly. But uh, it was weird how um when he fought Clay, he was more active off his back trying to get up and throwing up submissions. When he fought me, he didn't really throw up any submissions or try to get up. And my game plan was I was thinking that the taking the path of uh, the path of least resistance. And I thought I knew I had I had a big uh, grappling advantage. I, I I could just see it. So I knew if I took him down, I'd be able to get a submission. But he never gave me the opportunity to get the submission because he kind of just was content staying in the guard. So that took me by surprise. I really wasn't expecting that. I was expecting him to, to show more urgency to try to get up or look for a submission and then me to exploit that and, and get his back and be able to choke him out. Uh, after that, and before you found out that you're going to the playoffs, did you consider dropping down back to 145? Did you think that the size played a factor in any you know of those uh, two no nothing like that okay <laughs> no, 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 no i, I couldn't bro i could not do 45 like me doing 55 this is my third time in a row in the, in the last what four months or something like that i can't imagine doing this at 45 three times in a row dude it would, it would just destroy my body okay all right so I, I was just wondering if you thought that the size um played a factor yeah. in any of the performance i mean it looked like oam was a little bit bigger than you out there yeah but yeah he he was definitely he was definitely bigger than me but that was my first fight at 55 um this is not now my third fight and my last fight i was about five pounds heavier than my first one my, my first one was my first time at 55 and i got way too low way too quick it was such an easy weight cut that i was like in the back of my mind i was kind of worried about it because i was like dude i'm not gonna rehydrate to that that big like i'm gonna go back into the cage with you so for for that fight when I fought OAM, I weighed the same as when I fought Josh M at one forty five. Wow, and what is yeah. that? I was I was one hundred and seventy four pounds. Damn. Okay, you you weighed one hundred seventy four for a featherweight fight. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Holy crap! How did you add that much? Yeah. That's almost thirty pounds. Yeah. It it was it was. I ate a little bit too much that time. <laughs> okay. That was that That's was a not, little too much. You don't want to add that much, right? No, I, I, I didn't want to get to 74. That wasn't the plan. I wanted to be around 170. That, that, was, that was the plan, but it looked too okay. much this time. So you said that uh, when you landed, you, you, you saw on your, your, your buddy's phone. Like, how did you actually find out that you were officially in? Did someone call you? Like, yeah, yeah, my manager. So what? Malcolm oh. called me. My manager called me, and then he's like, oh, dude, you're in. And I was like, D-. I'm, I'm thinking, like, I'm going into full dad mode. I'm like, all right, I just yeah. won the fight. All right, I'm pocketing some money. I'm gonna just kick back for the summer, enjoy it with my with my family, with my wife, my kids, my new baby coming. And then I land, and I'm like, all right, everything I said from to my wife, I'm like, uh, never mind, because we're right back into camp again. <laughs> we have nine and a half weeks, so it it was it completely uh the the emo- like an emotional roller coaster, honestly. So PFL's decision to put you in and to take Natan out was heavily criticized. How do you feel? Like obviously you benefited from it, but if you can sort of remove yourself from the equation, yeah. Yeah, yeah, do you yeah. feel like they had a point? Do you feel like it was the right call? So yes and no. So it's a it's a shit position to be in. Like I I 100 percent feel for those guys. I said it before. Like you, it, he's his one of them is the godfather of the other one's daughter. They're best yeah. friends. I'm like that sounds like a terrible position to be in. I can't fault them for fighting the way that they fought. I, I one part of me understands why they did that. Like, I can't imagine going in there with like basically a brother to me and, and, and trying to knock his fucking head off and trying to crush his dreams. That's gotta be rough. And I saw those guys backstage after and they were both distraught because it, was, it they felt bad that they had to fight each other. And I, and I, and I feel for them. That's a hundred percent a shit position to be in. So I can't judge the way they fought, but then putting myself in the PFL shoes, I understand why they made that decision because it's, it's a league. It's a professional league. You got, you got people betting on the fights. I mean, like if you bet on that fight, you kind of got to avoid that, Avoid that bet I and mean, it puts the PFL in a really weird position. But that's why I keep saying it, it had I don't think it had anything to do with me per se. I think, like I said, had Yamato knocked me out, I think they would have yeah. given him the opportunity as well. The crazy thing about it is like you were their big free agent signing, and since you benefited from it, people started to look at it yeah, a yes. little bit suspiciously. Exactly. That's why that, that's why I'm like, damn, man. Like it, if it was anyone else, no one would say anything, but it, it's me now. It looks like they're playing favoritism. I'm like, that kind of fucking falls on me like it's it's i didn't it's not my fault you yeah. know what i mean like 
I, I listen, I was given this opportunity and all I can do is make the absolute most out of it. And that's exactly sure. what I'm doing. I don't think anyone should begrudge you or, or fault you. You're just taking the opportunity and running with it. Um, they could look at those two guys and the way in which they fought and the PFL's decision. To me, you're just the guy who is is there and got the call and any fighter would take that. I know you were preparing for your exactly. fight because yours came on afterwards, but did you see their fight while yeah. you were in the locker room and did you think something was off or are you too much in the zone yeah. where you're not really paying attention? No. No, I, I, they they fought before I even started warming up, so I was I was sitting back there back there watching, and I could tell, and I was like, yeah, I was like, this is, I right off the bat, I was like, all right, that's, that's how it's going to be because they're 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 obviously super close. So I was like, all right, I don't see it going. It's clearly going to go to the decision. They clearly don't want to hurt each other, and again, I'm not judging because again, I've never been in that position before. So I was like, oh, I, I can see what, how this is going. It was very strange. So it, it like. Even calling it a sparring match isn't really fair because at least in sparring you're yeah. you're kind of going yeah. all out. Here it just felt like you know they were just going for like a light sort of like feeling out process, right? Like just just to get the body moving. Like it felt like there was yeah. no bad intentions that, in anything that was being thrown. More more of a grappling match it looked like because they they looked like they were grappling. The wrestling exchanges and, and, and the grappling exchanges those looked like they were they were harder. The strikes obviously I think they only landed a handful of strikes between the both of them. So, I, but again, like I said, as soon as it started and they started fighting like that, I was like, I can see how it's going. Uh, I feel for those guys, it's a shit situation to be in, but I'm, I, I, I'm just the person who uh, got granted this opportunity. And so, like you said, uh, now this is your third fight and, and you're fighting next Wednesday. So a week from today, since April, uh, and, and you're, thank God you're fighting at 55, not 45, but this is a lot of activity in the span yeah. of what, four months? How is your body feeling? I'm at PT right now. Literally just finished up with, with with a PT session, but that's not to say that I'm hurting. It's just I, I do I do PT regularly just to maintain. But honestly, I didn't know how my body would hold up, and I'm surprised that I, I think 55 has been monumental. I wouldn't have been able to do this at 45. My body would just be destroyed. But I, I'm feeling pretty damn good. I think this one I actually feel good, better than my last two. Honestly, really? Why is that? Yeah. Any particular reason? I. My after my my first fight OAM, I didn't take a break. I literally jumped right back because I lost the fight, so I was just pissed. And I literally jumped right back into training a couple of days after, and just went right into the next camp. After my second fight, I was like, let me actually take a break because I was like 14 weeks of straight training where I was like, I need a physical and mental break. So I took an actual week off where I didn't do anything for a week, and I came back and I was like, I actually feel great right now. I tapered my 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 second week, so I went light, and then my third week started picking it up. So I, I did it a lot smarter, I'd say, because you don't really know what to expect. You, you think you know what to expect on paper with the season format, but you don't know what to expect until you're actually in it. So it's kind of like I'm learning on the go from the first fight, second fight to the third fight now. So now my third fight, I feel like I, I was able to get my footing in and see how, how this is going to play out. So the stuff that people have said about, you know, the format being tougher than it seems, some of the UFC veterans talking about this, all legit, you could back that up? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's 100%. percent could li- Everybody knows this This is a mental sport, man. This is a mental sport, but the season format is even more mental. It, it really fucking is. You're not really getting a break, and then you're going fight camp to fight camp. But it's not just a fight camp, and you're going fight uh, weight cut to weight cut to weight cut. And even though I'm fighting at 55, it's it's not as hard at for, as 45, but it's still not an easy weight cut at all. Like I still have to count my macros and stuff, the way everything I'm eating. Um, and that's just mentally taxing. And I mean, like having to constantly be, be in a diet, it's fucking annoying. I, I hate, I fucking hate cutting weight, man. I can't tell, can't tell you. Like everybody talks about Patty Pimblett and like his eating disorder. It's a hundred percent legit. I a hundred percent have an eating disorder. Like dude, after, after a fight, it's like, I, I have like two days where I can eat like crazy. And I'm eating to the point where I'm like in pain, in pain or like bad sick, dude, it's bad. I went to the, I went to the buffet at Caesar's Palace after the OM fight, and I, I they had they had, they had the, the fighter buffet like backstage after the fight. So I went and I ate a bunch of bunch of sh- shitty food. I was like, damn, we had this fucking Caesar's Palace uh, reservation, and it's like a hundred bucks a person. I was like, I, I gotta get my money's worth, so I'm definitely eating again. So I, <laughs> I was like, I'll be hungry again in an hour. I, I got to the buffet and I was like, dude, I'm not hungry at all, but it looks amazing. I'm trying everything. I couldn't. I almost needed a wheelchair. To get back to my car, yeah. but it was, it, I was in pain. Yeah, so like the eating disorder shit, it, it's only getting amplified now at this point. <laughs> What's your biggest vice? Food wise, sweets. sweets. I, dude, I got a huge sweet tooth. Huge sweet tooth. It's bad. So, like, what in particular? Ice cream, chocolate, ice cream. Candy, I, ice cream. 
ice cream, but I don't discriminate. I love, like, I love cookies, man. I love, I love cheesecake. Oh, it, uh, I can't even give you one thing. Brownie Sundays. Yeah. Is there one go to after a big win, like something that you have to have to celebrate? Yeah, brownie Sunday. Like a hot, Sunday. hot brownie with, with, with ice cream on top. But, uh, but I also oh, want like a nice fat cheeseburger with bacon and like salty french fries, crispy salty french oh, fries. My. <laughs> You're making me yeah. starving right now, too. Yeah. Uh, this is tremendous. <laughs> uh, is, is, the, uh, is the dream win next Wednesday and then meet OAM again? Is that, is that what you're hoping for? A hundred percent, man. The stars are aligned. Like this next one's being in, in, at MSG. I'm like, come on, that's perfect. And then, yeah. and then he, he's the favorite for his next fight. I think he should win that fight. It's not an easy fight, but he should win that fight. And then me and him in the finals, that's the storybook ending right there. Win the championship, yeah. get avenge that loss. And I, I don't know where the, that finale is going to be. I mean, if it's in New York, that'd be fucking great. Finale card again in New York. That'd be, I'd sell the place out. So yeah, that'd be awesome. How many people are you expecting next Wednesday for you? We will be able to see exactly how many people because they use the, the the code to buy tickets. I don't know what it's at now, but it's going to be. I honestly, I'm going to say well over 150 people. Wow, just for you, yeah. just the one. Yeah, you should get yeah. a cut yeah. of yeah. that. I, like, I, I, I have a huge, I have a huge team, so I have a, a lot of training yeah. partners coming, a lot of people coming in. Yeah, I remember. Uh, I think it was the event at Nassau Coliseum back in the day. There was yeah. one event where it just felt like. Half yeah. the arena was your team. Yeah. You know what I'm talking that about? That was it, yeah. Yeah, it was, that it was, was me, it. Jimmy, and Lyman fought. Yeah, and then we had like the whole parking lot was put, what's, they were like all doing a tailgate and everything like that. That was, that yeah, was yeah, yeah, that's exactly. one of my favorite fights. Yeah, that's when I fought Pepe. That was one of my favorite fights ever. Uh, what do you make of these, uh, these rumors of PFL buying Bellator? Would you like that? Hell yeah. That'd be, that'd be awesome. That's more competition. And then I don't know how the, I think the season will be different if that happens because you can't have a, like, you kind of got to earn your way into the season. I feel like, which would yeah. be fun. You would have more regular, um, I guess, off season fights, and then the guys that win those off season fights would get put into the season. So I think that that opens up a lot more uh, opportunities too. My, my idea was every division. Let's say there's eight fighters or ten fighters in the in the weight class. Let's say fifty five. You have five or four PFL fighters going up against five or four bellator fighters and so then there's bragging rights of like pfl versus bellator and they're representing oh, sure. their you know what i mean and then you see who <laughs> no, at the that, end that. gets more belts <laughs> that's like wcw versus wwe back in the day yes, that, that, that's, that's actually, exactly that'd it that'd be cool that'd be cool <laughs> I, I didn't even think of that that's a, that's a great that's a great idea <laughs> they need to NWO play that up the invasion the... yes yes yeah. play it up yep. tell peter murray you can you can run yeah, with that NWO over, yeah remember that I will. yes yeah. that was amazing <laughs> those are good old days man those were the good old days. Um, looking yeah. forward to your return. Good luck, Shane. Thank you so much. Uh, don't sweat, you know, the haters and shit like that that are uh, trying to, to pin this all on you. You're just benefiting from it and 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 doing so yeah. in a big way. So good luck next Wednesday. Looking forward to it. Thanks for coming on as always. Appreciate you, brother. Have a good one. All right. All right. There he is, Hurricane Shane Burgos. What a crazy story that was. Um, it didn't get a whole lot of time to get right into it there because he was uh, standing by, but uh, that was the one where Natan Schultz and uh, Hausch Manfio were fighting. They were friends. They didn't really want to fight each other. And it just looked, I mean, grappling match, it just looked like two friends, you know, feeling each other out. And uh, the next morning, uh, this was back in late June, the next morning PFL said that, you know, essentially they, they, they weren't competing in the uh, the spirit of competition and uh, Natan ended up winning the fight via decision, but they pulled him from it. And as a result, the next man up was big free agent signing Hurricane Shane Burgos. And so he benefited from it. Uh, a lot of people thought they made that decision so they could um, they could put Shane in that spot. Um, but to his point, you know, had he lost, he would like to think, and I would like to think as well, that they would have put Yamato Nishikawa in that spot as well. Um, it just was a bad look. And I don't know how they avoid this in the future. I don't know how they, they, I mean, they just ultimately like they have to know who's going to be matched up with who. Um, but the fighters as well should probably speak up if they're not going to fight, you know, and, 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 and keep the sanctity of the sport alive and well, uh, that's a problem as well. Cause it's just a bad look for everyone. So, uh, interesting, uh, little stumbling block roadblock incident that they had to overcome uh feels like most people have 
gotten over it at this point. Maybe not in a ton. I know he uh, he asked Francis Ngannou to to speak up on his behalf. So let's see what happens here and how they deal with these situations in in the future. But for now, uh, Clay Collard is next for. Uh, Shane Burgos and uh, OAM is also on that card going up against Bruno Miranda. Right now, Burgos Collard is the main event and OAM Bruno Miranda, which is interesting since uh, OAM is the defending champion, is the co-main event. That's next Wednesday, August the 23rd at the theater at Madison Square Garden. Let's go back to Boston now. UFC 292, uh, first title fight for Sugar Sean O'Malley. We had him on the show last uh, Wednesday. We had Aljamain Sterling from the airport this Monday. I wanted to check back in with... Sugar Sean O'Malley's head coach, Tim Welch, who has been on the show before. We had him right when this fight was announced, and uh, it was a great a great chat. I enjoyed it very much, and so I wanted to check in with him. He's doing a thousand things over there in Boston. He's got the Red Hawk recap. He's got the, the, the Sugar and Timbo show. He's got the Patreon. He's got the YouTube channel. He's got the vlogs. He's kind enough to carve out some time for us here on the program on this Wednesday. There he is. Tim Welch is here. Hello, Tim. How are you? And I have to apologize because I just watched your last uh, vlog and you were sitting there with a knife, like a switchblade, and you said that you hated when people were late to interviews. And 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 here I am a few minutes late to our interview. It's because we got a little backed up. It was a live show and I tried my best to give you an exact time, but I kept thinking about you and the knife saying that you hated when people were late to interviews. So here I am saying sorry to you. Austin, fight weeks are a little boring, so we ain't got much to do. I don't mind it at all. Good to be back. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you, Tim. Thank you for coming on. Uh, what are the vibes like? I know you guys got out there on Monday. Massive week for you and Sean, for the whole team. Uh, here we are kind of midway through, three days out. Can you can you describe the vibes, the setting, the scene, everything that's going on? I mean, yeah, the vibes are phenomenal. We got, we got a good team that we really trust and who really cares about Sugar. And uh, the week's going pretty smooth so far. Uh, he's still got about probably 12, 13 pounds to cut. And uh, that's the fight before the fight. So we're just focused on focusing on keeping him, um, keeping the vibes good around him. And he's always a gamer. So he's always confident. It's weird because it's such a big, huge fight. And he's the nerves are no different than any of the other fights. So it, it, we're, do, we're doing their job. And, and two follow-ups there, 12, 13 pounds. Is that common for him at this point in the week? Yeah, I think he's about exactly what he was um, on the uh, Wednesday before fighting Peter. So he, he records all that stuff in his journal and stuff. So exactly what we were before we fought Peter. Okay. And uh, you, you, you mentioned the nerves. N- nothing different, no feelings, you know, like nothing off, no, no anxiety, no, I don't know, tension, nothing different considering how much bigger this fight is? Yeah, it's so weird with him. I've been around fighters for a lot of years, and and they really beat themselves up fight week, but just really no nerves from him. And there was no nerves for Peter also. And, like, Peter's a scary dude who's going to butcher you and cut your face and batter your legs and really beat your ass. And still, he had no nerves. Um, He's one of the best performers I've ever met. When the the lights turn on, you're going to see the same sugar. Which fight concerned you more? Which opponent, which matchup concerned you more, Jan or Aljo? Aljo for sure. Aljo for sure. He, he, I mean, this is, I'm, pr- I'm pretty nervous about this fight just cause I know the type of athlete Aljo is. I know it's five rounds. He's just an expert wrestler. He's an expert grappler. His confidence is really high coming off beating up Henry, beating up uh, TJ smoking Corey Sanhagen with ease. So his confidence is really high. He's got a great team. He's got great cardio, uh, yeah, th- th- this fight I'm more nervous about than most just because of the stylistic matchup. But I know there's ways for us to win, and I'm just trying to focus on those. So you, you mentioned, and I appreciate the the candor, that, that you're pretty nervous for this fight. It doesn't seem like Sean is nervous, a, a, as you said, like behind the scenes, but even when he's talking to the likes of me. But he's always kind of that way, like, you know, supremely confident, a little bit dismissive, etc. Uh, would you say that you're more nervous about this matchup than he is? Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. I, for sure. I am just because just like I said, the stylistic matchup, he's so funky. He's so strong. He's so dangerous when he clasps his hands around your body, around your legs. Um, if it was in a basketball court, I'd be a lot less nervous, but it's in a cage and that's where Aljo's dangerous up, up against the cage, obviously. And you make one mistake and he's on your back and it could be the end of the fight. So 
really focus on keeping him just disciplined, disciplined for 25 minutes, stay on the balls of his feet and just trust his athleticism. And, uh, he's, he's feeling very sharp right now, very sharp, very accurate. So feeling the vibes from him. And just after our workouts, I'm, I'm more confident each time. And I, I truly think there's a good chance he's going to knock Aljo out. Really? You, you really, feel, I, I saw you tweet that as well. Um, obviously you're always confident in your guy, but wh why the knockout and why are you so confident about this particular, this particular fight and that particular finish? I mean, being funky like Aljo is a little bit what makes him dangerous, but also against someone who's as accurate as Sean. And if you make a mistake, if you're backing out, tilting your head the wrong way, and you're really not good with your defense, and he does do that sometimes. Sometimes he'll throw a strike and, and run away really awkward and leave his chin floating up a lot. And I saw the people he's been sparring with, and they're just they're really nothing like Sugar at all. And uh, we've sparred people like Aljo that are as good of grapplers as Aljo. I don't think Aljo's ever sparred anyone as good on the feet as Sugar. Mm. Do, do you, so you bring in people to try and replicate his style? Yeah, yeah, the best we can. And like I said, this has been a, a long, long fight camp. Uh, but yeah, definitely we have grapplers that are as good as Aljo. What do you make of their, their bet about the takedowns and all that? I mean, there's no way you want him to try to shoot for a takedown, right? That would make no sense. Yeah, but just like you, you saw, you saw with with Peter, he he's got some sneaky takedowns that'll put people flat on their face, and they're they're not even really like explosive double legs or single legs. They're duck unders that he's he, he can duck under people both ways. So I wouldn't be surprised if he dumps out Joe. <laughs> I love. It. Do do you feel like people underrate Sean's grappling? I think so. I think so because. With a striker like Peter, Sean's very dangerous on the fence, too. He can, like I said, he can knock you out with both limbs. He throws subtle feints that from the TV, you can't see him from the TV. But when you're standing right in front of him, there's subtle feints that really mess people up. Um, with Peter, we weren't worried about putting our back on the fence because we knew how dangerous he was there. Um, a huge focus on this fight camp is keeping him off the fence. So it's going to be a little bit different. I think it's going to be harder to grab Sean than Aljo thinks. I said at the beginning of this show, I've said it before, that I think that Aljamain Sterling is the most underrated champion in the UFC right now. Uh, underappreciated, underrated, all that stuff. Do you agree with that? I, I do agree with that. I do agree with that. Put that same skill set into the 155ers, into the welterweights, into any of those guys who's just so strong and physically strong. Our, our jiu-jitsu coach is an ADCC world champion, a black belt world champion IBGGF and he even talked about how freakishly strong he was and just good at grappling he was um and Aljo comes out and he throws spazzy kicks and he's such a spaz and that and that those kind of people are really hard to fight and I know he's going to come out and he's going to sprint at Sean just like he did Corey Sandhagen um and hopefully we have the answer to it uh what is it you know that fight was to me of all Aljo's wins and and the big ones as of late None more impressive than what he did to Corey Sanhagen. And you just see it like that fight continues to age well, considering what Corey does to everyone else. For you as his coach, and based on what you are preparing for, what is most important about like the first 90 seconds or two minutes of this fight that, that Sean can't afford to do, that you are preparing for, that you know is coming, and that you can't have Sean do? What is the mistake that perhaps Corey made in that fight that can't be replicated in the first few minutes of your fight? Yeah, I mean, Corey, Corey was backing up. I mean, he sprinted right at him. Corey was backing up, and he threw a kick, and he pretty much tripped tripped from that kick, and Aldo got to his back, and Corey made the mistake at kind of trying to stand up right away. And, uh, yeah, backing up, throwing kicks, backing up, there's always a chance you could fall over. So I think that's a big mistake Corey made that they would fix next time. Okay. Um, you're putting out a lot of content this week, uh, tons of stuff, like almost every day. I saw you even packing, you're packing like high level microphones and stuff like yours, your equipment's way better than mine. And, uh, I kind of do this for a living. I know you do it as well, but you know, you have a, you have a day job. Uh, are, are you able to, to stick to this schedule? I mean, you do have a big fight to prepare for, for your guy. Have, have you been able to, uh, put out the content that you're, you're hoping to put out thus far this week? Yeah, we just recorded a Red Hawk recap with our strength and conditioning coach and our, our nutritionist, Dan Garner, who are super, super smart people. 
So I was able to record that. We and it, in fight week, you always just try to find things to kill the time. We work out probably once a day, and just most of the time we're hanging out. So it's a good time to pump out the content for sure. Why do you love doing this so much? A lot of coaches aren't doing this. Why do you love doing it? Mainly, I like doing my podcast because it helps a lot of people. I feel like I live a pretty happy life, like a truly happy life. And I think a lot of the younger kids these days don't know how to live a happy life. They're filled with anxiety and filled with all this stuff. And they don't have like real guidance from anyone because their teachers aren't going to guide them a certain way. So I think learning the stuff that I've learned from my coaches and the books that I've read and the things that I've learned and just giving them back to the younger folks, I, I enjoy doing that. Could I ask, like, what are one or two keys to living a happy life? What, what comes to mind off the bat when I ask you that question that you, that you must be doing every single day? I mean, I think for sure, if you have relationships, you need to have a healthy relationship and you need to be hydrated and you need to be eating real foods, actual foods that aren't processed, aren't filled with a bunch of crap. Um, and, and, and just doing your best at sleeping good, having a good night's sleep trying to do your best at making your relationships good and actually taking care of your body. I think if you do those things, you're going to live a happier life than most. Was there a point where you weren't living a happy life? Uh, all through my fighting career, it was pretty stressful. I was always worried about what's, what's next, fight weeks. The fight camps were always really stressful because I know I needed to win. I needed the money for the win bonus, and I needed to keep improving. That's one thing I admire about Sean is he just – doesn't even worry about any of that and none of that stuff phases him a lot of people beat themselves up so bad during fight week and even in the locker room and i think it has a lot to do with the the veterans like uh cowboy cerrone or J jamie varn or joe riggs those guys that have been in fights and bad things have happened in those fights i think it makes it harder to just have no emotions the next time around so once sean does go through adversity we'll see how he is again those fight weeks but uh, yeah, it, those times in my life were a little bit stressful, fighting for money, being broke, always worrying about the next fight. Um, so then just starting to read and, and learning about what actual true, like peace and happiness is helped a lot. Uh, as far as his UFC run is concerned, you know, it, it, it's been fairly smooth. Obviously there, you know, the, the, the Cheeto fight, but some have chalked that up to the injury. The Pedro fight was, was disappointing. Um, but those weren't like you know, him getting knocked out or anything like that. And so do you wonder how he will react when he is truly faced with adversity? Because he hasn't really been faced with that just yet. Yeah, there's no way to, to really tell until it happens, but he's, he's got all, he's got the tools. He's got the mental tools and he, he's a very smart kid. He reads a lot of books and he studies other athletes and different stuff. So I truly think he's just a one of a kind athlete. So when that stuff does happen, I think he's going to be good at just staying in the moment and not worrying about what happened in the past and stuff. Um, he has, he has claimed that he's the best sleeper in the UFC. What about versus you? Who is, who's the better sleeper? Probably this fight camp. I'm, I, I'm the king of sleep this fight camp, but uh, okay. he, he had, he's had a bunch of stuff. He's moving to his new farm. He had some stuff going on, but still his sleep is, is up there above most. And and for you, what's what's the the perfect amount? How many hours? I like to get a I like to get a solid eight and a half nine. Okay, wow. And how often do you do that every week? Like every day? Are you are you are you getting the eight to nine, or are there some some days that are shorter? Uh, every day, every day I get wow. eight to nine hours of sleep. Yep, get a good morning routine, and then head to the head to the dojo and train the soldiers. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the morning routine because you, you are a big proponent of it. When you're at the hotel, when you're fight week, is it hard to keep up the morning routine? Yeah, it's a little little different. Me, Takino, and one of our training partners, Ezra, they had a, um, some black belt training, and it was at, well, 6 a.m. AZ, AZ time. So I had to wake up really early, get a cold brew in me, head, head, to, head to training. So the routine gets definitely thrown off quite a bit when, when it's fight week. Do you feel thrown off? Like, do you feel like your your whole your whole rhythm is thrown off because you're 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 not sticking to the routine? No, we're used to it. Used to it. I mean, we've been doing we've been doing. I mean, I've had probably the last eighteen fights with Sean Fight Week, 
and it's uh-huh. we have a good team around us. Each, each each fight we're adding usually adding one more person to the team, and I think we got it all dialed in now. But yeah, we've been doing this for for a lot of years, so we're we're used to it. And and for you personally, like this this is obviously a big deal for for you and Sean and 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 the team. Uh, but you're going up, you know, you're the head coach and you're going up against one of the legendary coaches in this game, uh, Ray Longo and, and Matt Serra, one of the legendary teams in this game. And you're relatively young to be a head coach, right? And so does this feel like a like a moment for you as well? I know you don't want to make it about yourself. It's it's about Sean, but this is this is a massive spotlight on you as well. Do you think about that sort of thing and what it would be like to beat a team like that on a stage like this with these kinds of stakes? Not really. I don't think about it that much. I just think about it just the same stuff we've been doing. It's it's Sean versus Aljo. I don't think about all the all the other stuff. I know he does have a good team though, and he he has a bunch of smart coaches that have been in world title fights before that are great grapplers that have like Chris Weidman versus Anderson Silva. Uh, just so many, so many, and uh, I mean it's an honor to coach against those guys, and we'll make it that much sweeter if we can knock out Aljo Cold. Do you believe this is his last fight at 135? If if Sean knocks him out and he flatlines him and puts him on his face, he's going to want that rematch. And especially if he sees this is probably going to be his biggest payday there's a, he's ever been, he's going to be trying to push for the rematch probably. Okay. Uh, Sean has said uh, he knocks out Aljo, and then uh, if Cheeto wins, he'd like to have that fight again in December. What would you prefer? Like if the scenario is... Sean knocks out Aljo, Cheeto also wins. Would you like Sean Aljo too, or would you like to avenge the Cheeto loss? Uh, definitely. The, I mean, the, the, Cheeto, the Cheeto fight, that's got to happen. And it's got to happen pretty soon. So we're really hoping uh, Cheeto gets the job done. I mean, even if he doesn't get the job done, who knows? That fight's going to happen probably in the, next, in the next year. So I look forward to that fight. Do you think Cheeto beats Pedro Munoz on Saturday? That's an interesting fight. I just, yeah, I always count out Pedro because how short he is, and he's not like phenomenal everywhere, anywhere, but he's really, really good, tough, and durable. He's got good calf kicks. It just depends what Cheeto shows up. If the Cheeto shows up, that's versus Corey Sanhagen, and Pedro Munoz takes him down. It didn't look like Cheeto knew any jujitsu at all against Corey Sanhagen. I don't know, I don't know what happened, but I guess it depends what Cheeto shows up. Kind of like the Rob Font fight, uh, Font fight as well, right? I mean, Corey has the ability to make guys look like that. Yeah, and I think Rob Font expected a striking match and didn't expect uh, Corey to take him down early on and wear on his frames. And it's a five round fight, and anyone who's ever been in a fight knows how how tiring one little grappling scramble can make you. So smart of Corey to take him up, take him down early on. I don't know if he was doing that because he tore his tricep, but that was a good right. game plan by Corey. All right, so the official prediction is a knockout. That's what you're feeling. Are we, well, are we are we feeling a particular round? What are you thinking? Yeah, I think what's so scary about the Aljo fight, too, is I think he, most people, everyone's plan is to cut Sean off, get him against the cage. That's everyone's plan. But then when they once they get in front of him, it's harder than they think. But I think Aljo is confident enough and scary enough to where he's going to take some risks. He's going to take some risks. He, he's going to force a takedown. So that could either uh, go in our favor or not. So if I if I had to guess right now, man, it's so tough. But I think Sean could knock him out in the first round. Wow, really? You're not trolling right now. You're you're being serious. I definitely think it's possible. Golly, last time we saw uh, Aljo get knocked out was against Marlon Rice. He has not lost since. That was a vicious knockout. Nope. It's kind of shocking that he was able to rebound and turn into this fighter, right? I mean, like there was a period there where we didn't know if he was going to get up. You remember that? Yeah, I was there cornering Scott Holtzman for that fight, and that was scary. I thought he was dead. Yeah. And so you're envisioning something similar. You're envisioning out cold possibly as soon as the first round. Yes. I mean, he Aljo hasn't fought anyone like Suge and Suge hasn't fought anyone like Aljo. So no one really knows, but from training, training with him, yeah, I think that's a good possibility. Well, I can't wait for it. Uh, where can people get your content this week? Um, 
on on uh on youtube at tim welch mt i'm trying to upload there at least at least every day and then in instagram also at tim welch mt patreon too right yeah patreon.com slash red hawk academy i'm just doing a bunch of behind the scenes stuff on there and uh uploading content there all the time just trying to get you paid tim i'm just you know trying to show some love to the pages <laughs> Um, I appreciate it. Bro. Uh, much love to you guys. Uh, good luck. Thanks for coming on. Can't wait for the fight. Wish you guys the best. All right, Ariel. Talk to you soon, brother. Hey, Peace. There's the song. Do you hear the song, by the way? Do you hear it? Oh, he left. I don't hear <laughs> no, it. Do you hear it? You don't hear it. I don't hear it. <laughs> now what about I hear now? Do you hear a glimpse of it? <laughs> Is that it? Is that the right one? A glimpse. That's oh, it. Glimpse. All right. <laughs> thanks, Sean. Oh, th thanks, Tim. Appreciate it. Take care. I got screwed up there. Why didn't you play it at the start, Frank? Um, I didn't want to confuse or did anyone. You, or you did were I? afraid? Yeah. No, he missed the opportunity. Ah, uh, I thought for sure. Yeah, I had it ready it. to go, and and then I, I, did we really break the fourth wall here with what happened at the beginning? To you know, no, don't. Yeah, go ahead. What? Yeah, oh, with his had, audio. Yeah, Tim, Tim wasn't yeah, up because what? he was he was too back and forth on whether or not to play the song. He forgot to put Tim. <laughs> oh <on. laughs> my god. Are you kidding? Because I was wondering. I asked him a question about. I, mean, look, I, I watched. I, I watched his vlog this off. morning. I mean, it was like half the answer, if I'm being honest. I watched. It's a vacay this day, man. You're at home. We're, yeah, what we, vacay letting, day? We're fucking. The, it says on the, the calendar. Aerial vacay here. confirmed. Oh my gosh! I was wondering about that. Why yeah, is I'm his sorry. audio a little off? slow on the fader? <laughs> oh yeah. And then I thought the music was going to play, but I didn't want to. I didn't want to touch it if it was not going to play. So I was waiting for it. Then you played it on the outro. Look, man, this makes the song that much better because there's so much thought goes into it. And we have confirmed that is, in fact, the oh, theme yes, music for, for the Red sure. Hawk recap. I think he just, right. I, I think the Red he Hawk himself just confirmed it. He I almost feel like he doesn't time. want to acknowledge. Like he was yeah, a little that's bit embarrassed. What I thought. He's like, oh, I don't hear yeah. it is a lie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, hope, hopefully, we don't get uh, flagged for that. Copyright? We, we're Do you good. think he we're owns good. the rights to that song? He doesn't own the rights. We have credits <laughs> for it. He flags right. it. He goes and flags <laughs> copyright flag from right. Tim Watch. Oh my gosh! Uh, what about that Andre Petrosky? Huh? Crazy! What a story! A heavy stuff. Super heavy. Um, still Love to come, by the way. I, I can't believe you didn't recognize that was that was leopard. You said cheetah. Oh, what is the difference between leopard and cheetah? I have no idea. If you know, you know. Do you know? Of course, yeah. So uh, still to come, Demetrius Johnson, Mighty Mouse. He's going to join us in about 18 minutes' time. Uh, so stay tuned for that. For now, though, speaking of UFC 292, let's continue that conversation. Uh, let's see what the guys are thinking regarding UFC 292. And then also still to come, On the Nose, everyone's favorite segment of the week, of course. This weekend, though, it's UFC 292. Oh, baby. TD Garden, Boston, Massachusetts. Al Jermaine Sterling against Sugar Sean O'Malley for the UFC Bantamweight title. What a massive main event that is. Co-main event. Zhang Wei Li 2.0 has looked fantastic since becoming champion again at 115 pounds against Amanda Lemos. The return of Ian Gary, who, of course, is carrying this card. He told us that himself on Monday, going up against the late replacement. Neil Magny, looking forward to that. Andre Petrosky against Gerald Mearshart. Cheeto Vera against Pedro Munoz. What about the return of Chris Weidman? Two and a half years in the making after one of the most devastating injuries in the history of the UFC going up against Brad Tavares, which I, I feel like is a very good matchup. It's great booking on the UFC's part. So all that and more, you could get in on all the action over at DraftKings Sportsbook. They are the official sports betting partner of not only the UFC, but this program as well. New customers can bet just $5 to get $150 in bonus bets instantly. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use code the MMA Hour. New customers can bet just five dollars on UFC 292 to get 150 dollars in bonus bets instantly. That's this Saturday only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code the MMA Hour. Also PFL on Friday as well. Gambling problem? Call 1-800 Gambler. In New York, call 8778 Hope NY or text Hope NY. That's 467-369. In West Virginia, visit www.100gambler.net in partnership with Hollywood Casino. At Charlestown Races, all games regulated by the West Virginia Lottery. Please play responsibly. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 
7777 or visit ccpg.org. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino Resorts in Kansas, 21 and older, most of the states, but age varies by jurisdiction. See DraftKings.com slash Sportsbook for details of state specific responsible gambling resources. Bonus bets expire seven days after issuance. Eligibility and deposit restrictions apply. Terms at Sportsbook.DraftKings.com slash MMA terms. Yeah. All right, guys. What are we thinking? What are we thinking? UFC 292 is here. What are the picks? What are the feelings? What are the thoughts? So we have Juliana coming back. We're going to try and redeem ourselves. Rick, are you, are you making a... What is that? Juliana. No, I get to Juliana. I get to sit this one out. Juliana's taking my spot. Ah, no, we said no up. elimination. Yeah, we said no. We said no elimination. Come on, what do you guys. mean? We said this is your time to bounce. So back. then, Ariel, you're picking, right? So no. you, Juliana. No, no, Connor. no. I, I, I respectfully removed myself. I felt like I was bringing the team down. So it's I redemption myself time, and... Rick. Rough few weeks. Yeah. It's it's time to get back in the winter circle. Man. I mean, see, look at this oh. negative energy. Why do I even want to come back to this? We no, need let me. Know. What, what, what negative energy? Negativity. We're trying to dude, get you just, back yes. in. Yes. We're trying to we're get, trying to get you back one. in. Welcome no, r- while we're rough, stating, pointing out the losses. Facts. I mean, no positive facts. It's it's not about. Yeah, that's okay. We're not going to be naive here. We're just stating the facts of what happened. Whether you take that with a negative connotation, that's up to you, man. Yeah, meeting. rough doesn't feel like a fact. It feels like you know a qualifier. It feels like you're you're placing your own kind of values on that, right? Whoa, whoa. Lost, Rick, you know, do it for me. Right mm, all right, I'm back in. Frankie, yeah. oh, Frankie asked. Yeah. Also, really left. can I just uh, ask why does Rick sound much louder than usual? Am I the only one who feels this way? Uh, he's yelling. He's very upset. No, no, something about the microphone is different, Frank. Rick, can you give me a five count? One, what? two, three, four, or five. Is that better, Ariel? <laughs> this sounds dramatically different. Maybe it's because I'm not in the studio, but everything else sounds the same. So Absolutely. that could probably be he's on yeah, that could probably be a factor. Yeah. Yeah. All right, fine. If you guys are okay with it, I'm okay with it. <laughs> uh, uh, but more I'm back. I mean, okay, we're back. We're back. Uh, all right, Rick let's hit the randomizer. The... I already have Juliana Pena's pick. She won last week. Let's see if she can get uh, another win. Let me randomize it though, real quick. Frank, nice. We'll go first. I'll go second. Oh, yeah. Rick will go third. To start us off before you go, Frank. Oh, all right. I'll go. I just have to give Juliana's pick. She will be going with strawweight champion Wiley Zhang to get it done. And still. By the way, how do we feel about Juliana not waiting to see where she? actually is supposed to pick and just come out right there. No, nah, that's and that's too much to ask. Pick. I feel like she we're getting we're saying. getting a superstar. If she's truly watching live, she would know, oh, I'm third pick, okay. No, she I'll actually, she actually told me that she's typically at practice, so she has to watch what a on demand. All right. How can we, yeah. You go, right. Juliana. She sends the picks yeah. before we pick, two weeks in a row. That's, that's enough for me. Okay. Yeah. Now, Frank, now it's up to you. All right. Saturday's a big fight. Looking forward to it. I want to take the That's Marlon great, Vera, Pedro Munoz over two and a half. Okay. Uh, over one and a half is available. Oh, if wow. that interests you at all. <laughs> well, let me look at that. <laughs> and, I mean, you said you said if it was available, yeah, you would think to... about it. Oh, wow. I'm just, That's I'm too, just high. Too, high. too high. Too high, minus 650. I'm going to okay. do all right, over a two and a half. A man of the people wow. over two and a half. All all right. Right. Minus 360. Neither guy ever been knocked down, nonetheless knocked out in their UFC careers. A careers period. So, I like that. I like that. I, I can't wait for this fight. I love this fight. Oh, man. I think it's going to be a good one. It's a good one. I think it's going to be a good uh, one. While we were on air or right before, like, Pedro Munoz had a pretty nice media day. Like, he was saying some some interesting things. And, and spicy and, uh, towards was the Tell us. Tell us. About what? About what? He, I missed it. He, he he half joked like obviously we know that he had the no contest against O'Malley with the eye poke. He said like yeah. I've 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 thought about like just effing him up in the hotel and then kind of oh, laughed geez. about like hey I'm a professional you know I'm a Christian and and did that whole thing. Um, but there's you, you could tell that he still wants that fight and and feels like if there's a if there's an opportunity if Sean O'Malley. Uh, becomes champion like there's a path to that where all of a sudden he can get redemption at, at in the highest uh possible stake so yeah uh this fight has a lot has a lot on the line for these guys especially i think especially with an o'malley win right it feels like pedro and cheeto have storylines with o'malley and now all of a sudden that's opened back up well he has to do this to a degree because i think the uh the initial feeling is go with cheeto if cheeto wins and oh, so sure. if he wins you for gotta sure. get people emotionally invested 
I, obviously, I mean, Cheeto versus Henry Cejudo was just amazing. Great matchmaking. But there is something special about these two guys being the two controversial fights in O'Malley's career on the same card where O'Malley is headlining over them. And they're, you know, <laughs> they've been around. Like, there's just something about all of this that is just a little bit funky. And then the winner of this fight, if O'Malley is able to shock the world and if Aljo doesn't want to stick around the the winner potentially getting another crack at him but with a lot more at stake it's it's all very nice and cozy it's it's fun a lot has to happen for that scenario to play out but he's doing the right thing he is i mean pedro's a very good mild-mannered guy he's not trying to fuck up anyone in the hotel i'm not trying to say that he's alive no. he's just like he doesn't seem no, no. like that kind it, of guy but i it understand was tongue where he's it, it was tongue in cheek and he walked it back immediately. But what was underneath that you could tell is that he really does feel like he got a raw deal in the O'Malley fight and obviously feels like he can compete with him and wants that back. I did find it interesting. Um, man, I derailed this. I apologize. But I did find it interesting that Tim said, like, win or lose, maybe it's Cheeto uh, to you just moments ago. So yeah. um, it, se it seems like they want that Cheeto fight. So, um, yeah. But yeah, I could see a world where Pedro and O'Malley happens. I don't think that's out of the realm of possibility at all, especially with a good performance here. All right, what else? Uh, yeah, my pick. Uh, right in the middle of making it. Before we went on the Munoz train there. Uh, anyway, wow. I'm going to go with Frank's <laughs> favorite fighter. Oh. The future, Ian Machado Jake Gary, Paul? taking on oh. Neil Magnet. Uh, minus 500. We are now at plus 102 before going over. Oh, this race. is just a straight money line. Straight money line. Oh, interesting. You don't usually Aaron, do did those. Did you mute yourself? Yeah. No, I, I hear him. You. Come on. I, I made no change. You all of a sudden became audible. What? Did you mute yourself, or were you just mouthing something? No. no. I hear him. I'm just sitting. Okay. Loud and clear. You hear me? What's going on right now? I can't, I can't yes. tell if you're, if you're messing with this. I think my medicine's a little too strong today. All right. Yeah, might Why be. are you taking medicine? Because you're sick? Still coming to work sick? Oh, wow. Boy. Who's next? Damn, GC's HR. just coming for everybody's yeah. neck. All right. I see how it is. And I mean, what? All right. All right. All right. I see how it is. I guess it's cool <laughs> if everyone shows up contagiously ill. But uh, yeah. No, that's on me. That's on me for sure. <laughs> Rick, you're big, man. Uh, this, this one's wow. easy. Um, it's, it's been tradition the last couple of fights. Uh, Aljamain Sterling, money line. Lock it in. That's yeah, that's the pick. There we go. We're riding that's with the champ. Tim I feel Welch like the odds here are you. favorable. Say that again? Tim Welch did nothing to convince you. Not one thing. No. This, this style matchup uh, that was good. Show, shows me everything I need to know. I'm confident in the Funk Master, and uh, I think he'll get it done again. All right. The what is he right now? What's the line right now? Minus two fifty eight. Aljamain Sterling. And uh, what is uh, what plus is Sean? Two ten plus two ten. Coming what is Sean via knockout? Uh, last I saw it was minus three fifty. Right now it is. I said I said minus three fifty. I'm at plus three fifty. It's now plus three thirty. Sean O'Malley by knockout on DraftKings wow. Sportsbook. And and what is Aljo via sub? Al Jermaine Sterling via sub on DraftKings Sportsbook, plus 150. I feel like if there's a finish in this fight, it like if there's a finish for Sean, it has to be Sean via knockout. And if there's a finish for Aljo, it has to be Aljo via sub. I okay, don't so necessarily they, love the fight goes I, the distance. I could see a TKO for Aljo on the ground, too. I think that's yeah, a real that's distinct possibility. possibility. There actually is a bet for what you just said, Ariel. Aljamain mm. Sterling to win by submission or Sean O'Malley to win by KO, TKO, DQ. Minus wow. 175 on uh, wow. the sportsbook right now. So I feel like that kind of backs up what I'm saying, right? To a degree. Yeah, that, that is the favorite in terms of uh, of a double chance. Aljo by decision or O'Malley by KO is minus 120. And then you're, and then you're getting to Aljo sub, O'Malley decision plus 100. So yeah, that, that is the favorite favored route of Got uh, it. double chance all right so those are the picks right those are the picks uh final is juliana zhang wei li uh frank over two and a half and marlon chito vera pedro munoz i'm going with the future ian machado gary and rick is going with Aljamain sterling plus 181 oh yeah i love it what else what else uh, we'll go to mine, my singles, my parlays, my picks for the weekend. We start out. I'm going to take the underdog in the much 
highly anticipated rematch between uh, Karini Silva and Marina Moroz. They fought back in 2014. Moroz armbarred her in uh, round one. Obviously, that was almost uh, 10 years ago. Uh, but it kind of feels like Silva is is finisher bust, if not suburb bust. I mean, she's never won a decision. Uh, Marina Moroz never been finished. I feel like this is this is kind of a jump in the UFC career of Karini Silva. Uh, I think Moroz can survive, and as the fight goes on, I I, I think she's going to be able to outpoint her or even get a finish for herself. I, I think a submission is live for Marina Moroz as well. I mean, Shardy did it. Granted, it was 10 years ago. It doesn't really matter at this point. Uh, but yeah, I think she's a live dog here, so I will be riding with her. Next up, the man we had on just uh, just a little bit ago, Andre Petrosky in the Gerald Mearshart. I'm going to be taking the under two and a half in this fight. I mean, both these dudes are dangerous. Mearshart obviously making up the majority of this with Petrosky only having 10 professional fights, but uh, 50 of their combined 61 professional fights have gone under the two and a half. Uh, 45 of 51 Mearsharts have not gone to a decision. Nine of ten for Petrosky. I think Petrosky could knock him out. I think he could sub him. Obviously, GM three is live for a sub. Uh, I think there's many ways that this fight can get finished. Both these dudes uh, are aggressive and violent. I guess the one thing to worry about is uh, either the grappling kind of equals each other out, or it's like a, a late finish. These guys have had late finishes many times in their career, uh, but I do think I think someone gets finished here. Next up. The All-American, he's back. I'm riding with him. Chris Weidman, money line, oh, yeah. big dog against Brad Tavares. I'm really, for me, this one just comes down to uh, neither of these guys are really in great form. Obviously, Weidman, a long layoff and a bad, very bad leg injury that he's coming back from. But both these guys have lost their last two fights. Weirdly enough, weird stat, uh, both last win are both over uh, Omari Akhmedov. Um yeah, I, I think I think Chris Weidman is alive if the leg is good. I, I think he has passed the victory. I think he can wrestle Brad Tavares. Much more of a, a pure striker. And Weidman, yes, six losses, all six by knockout. Brad Tavares, one knockout win in the last 12 years. I, I don't think he's going to add to that total here against Chris Weidman. So if this fight goes long, if it goes to 15 minutes, I, I think there's ways that Chris Weidman can win minutes in this fight and, and win a decision, or, or he's live for a finish as well. So... At the price, I'm uh, I'm willing to take a risk on it. Uh, plus, in studio here, Rick, I mean, you should be here with this beautiful illustration behind you. Look at that bad boy. Oh, yeah. Jean Galang sent this one over of Chris Weidman uh, before UFC 292. I mean, this thing uh, this thing looks great here. I mean, this is this is a good print. Uh, so shout out to him for sending that over. That's great stuff. Yeah, for uh, sure. Shout out, shout out to Jean Galang, the man. I Absolute mean, the man, legendary he did, artist. He did a sick one of O'Malley this week as well. Uh, so, yeah, we're riding with the man, the All-American, Chris Weidman. A uh, couple here to go. I'm going to take a flyer on Zhang Wei Li to get this one done by submission. I mean, I know mm. she did it uh, I know she did it last fight, so maybe it's kind of the square thing to do here to go right back to the well. But at the number, the discrepancy between knockout and submission when she only has a couple more knockouts than submissions in her career – Nice little uh, job hop from you there. I mean, that one sounded like you that? No it. Oh, yeah, we can hear it. I mean, especially when you do it. Wow. You know, right into the mic. But, uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. I didn't think it was that loud. <laughs> uh, it is. All right. Sorry, sorry. No, no, no. I mean, it's your thing. It's your thing. It's, Shout out Macha as well. Is, oh, is that her barking? Oh, yeah. That's great. Me, myself. Um, I mean, both these girls are super aggressive, super violent. Both have big-time finishing capabilities, whether it is a knockout or a submission. Uh, and I think this is going to be a frantic fight. And I think if it ends up on the ground, Jung is, is live for a sub. I, I don't think that uh, the odds reflect that. So I'm taking a little flyer on it. Uh, my main bet on this fight, though, will be the under. Like I just said, aggressive women finishing capabilities between both of them. Not for nothing, they've both also been finished. I know Zhang's was from sort of a... Uh, you know, a head kick that that doesn't happen very often. Um, but 33 of their combined 42 fights have gone under the three and a half and 12 of 18 in the UFC. Um, so I felt like this was a good price tag on on taking the under here. I I, I do expect violence in this one. I also expect violence in uh, in the main event. I know you said you don't necessarily love it, Ariel, but I I feel like the two options you laid out, a Sterling submission or an O'Malley knockout, uh, are both live here to happen. Um, I mean, going back and watching the the Piotr Jan O'Malley fight, he was able to get him to the ground 
on several occasions. And, and if Aljamain Sterling is able to do that, I, I think it's going to be a different story than the than Jan fight. And if it stays standing, I, I do favor O'Malley on the feet, and he obviously has that knockout power. And as Tim Welch has said, he can knock you out with any limb. Um, so I, I think both of those those are live. 25 minutes, I, I'm going to side on the, on the fact that it doesn't make it that far uh, by either – a Sterling submission or maybe a TKO or, or an O'Malley knockout. Um, before we get out of here, two two quick parlays. I'm going with Ian Gary and Wiley Zhang, money lines. Uh, and then lastly, a little prop crossover. Uh, I'm going over one and a half in Vera Munoz, under two and a half in Rodriguez to Lulin. And then I'm heading over to KSW, Saladin wow. Parnas to finish that one off. That one pays off. Uh, at minus 110. Really like both those props. Like I said, Munoz Farah, never been knocked down, never been knocked out in their UFC careers. I want to say it's, uh, it's I think it's nine straight for uh, for Munoz uh, going the the over one and a half, and, and Bear is like eight of his last ten. Um, and then Rodriguez to Lulin. I think they're just going to get in there and bang. They They almost always have violence in their fights, so like that parlay as well. Uh, and those are the picks. 292 weekend. Excited for it. I think it's going to be a really fun card. And uh, you'll, you guys will be doing a watch party on uh, Saturday, Saturday night. night. By the way, um, they have KSW on DraftKings? No. So how are you doing that? I'm oh. Use a different book. We... Hi. There's two of me. Um, uh, oh, okay. I understand. <laughs> uh, any any oh, PFL man. action? Uh, yes, I actually do have some PFL. Larissa Pacheco by knockout. Right. Yes, yeah. Uh, third time she's going to yeah. be fighting Elena Kolesnik. Um, you don't want, you don't want to, why didn't you want to highlight that? Uh, I actually just forgot to make a graphic. I'm <laughs> glad that you reminded me of that. Uh, and, uh, she's knocked her out in the first round, both fights. Took it at minus 150. I feel like that's, that's a very, very live possibility. Uh, and we'll see her back in the finals. And don't think I didn't notice the uh, the Boston Red Sox themed font. I mean, I, I, hon- really I honestly nice did touch. wonder. I mean, the the green no, monster I mean, is the man. background as well. How could you? I mean, how could you miss it? It was right there, smack dab uh, in our faces. <laughs> that, that's that's good stuff. I'm uh, I'm looking forward to all of that. And uh, nice of you to give KSW a shout out as well. Um, so I know right. now. I've, now it's, I feel like we were favoring. Uh, Favoring case that we were PFL. That's not the case. Uh, just forgot to make the graphic. All right. Uh, we'll hear from the guys um, in about 30 minutes' time when we do On the Nose. For now, let's say hello to the man that we just saw, I do believe. Uh, Demetrius Johnson is here in a fantastic studio. What is going on over here? I mean, the fact that our guest has a better setup than me is a little bit embarrassing uh, to a degree. Where are you right now? Are you in like a recording studio, DJ? What is going on over here? This is my streaming room. So right Jeez now, I'm, I'm actually working on another studio. <clears throat> so this is kind of like my recording studio, my gaming studio and where I record all my stuff for the GOAT cast, obviously. Um, Shout out. Yeah, this, this, this is where, where we're at right now. Bro, I saw your video with Henry Cejudo. Um that Benedict Arnold, that turncoat, no big deal. Uh, and it and it looks like you are in my house when you're when you're recording this. Like the camera quality is the greatest camera quality that I've ever seen in my life. I've never seen anything like it. Both of you look like you are actually in my house. How are you doing this? Um, one of the things that uh, Warren Buffett has always said: you invest in yourself. And so for me, I've always loved videography, photography. So I bought a cinema a cinema level camera. It's a Sony FX. And obviously your boy, Michael Wanzover, he's super talented and we work together and, you know, he's kind of taught me everything I know about lighting and all that stuff. Like this camera right here, the Logitech C3 is not a very good camera. Like I have a, mm. a Sony Alpha 6300. That's really good, but that's hooked up to this computer. So, I mean, this is kind of like where all the magic happens for my YouTube channel. You know, anything that I recording and anything like that it, it happens in this 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 studio i have another one being built right now you know two doors down i guess you can say <laughs> unbelievable what a setup i feel like a real schmuck uh listening to all of this uh but in any event great to see you and great to see that you're in good spirits happy belated birthday um are you feeling Thank okay you. can i is everything all right 
Yeah, yeah. Um, I got sick, man. Like it's the second time I've gotten sick in Mexico. Um, typically we do all inclusive sometimes. You know, we went to St. Martin for my son's birthday. Absolutely amazing food, amazing people out there. And the food was just amazing. It wasn't all inclusive. So every meal you're getting, they're cooking fresh, right? It's not, mm. you know, sit underneath, you know, a light or whatever you want to call it. This hotel you we went to, man, I'll tell you what, my buddy, we went out to dinner one night. My boy's dinner was a fucking TV dinner. He had mashed potatoes, a ribeye, and it looked just, it looked pitiful. It looked, they burnt the pasta. And I was like, how, how do you burn pasta? So I told the wife, I was like, babe, I'm, I think I'm done with all inclusive hotels or, or vacations. Like, I work extremely hard. I am going to go to vacations where I'm going to pay for every single meal. I'm okay with that. Right. So, yeah, so I got sick. Um, and we left the next day. I was like, I'm not going to play this game. We left, got home, got on some medication. And now I'm feeling much better. I just got done working out, lifting weights. And we'll see. We'll see how the body reacts where they want the medication. If, if, you don't, if you don't mind me asking, what I found so fascinating about this was to break the fourth wall, you were supposed to be on the show on Monday. And then I woke up to a text yeah. from you saying, I'm, I'm flying home. I'm leaving. Because you were going to you were kind enough to join us from vacation and then you're, I'm yep. leaving. I'm like, wait, you're leaving because you're sick. And you're like, yeah, I don't F around. I get sick. I'm out. So you had a whole vacation plan. You got, you just bolted because you got sick. Fuck. Yeah. So this isn't the first time I got <laughs> sick. I, I, I've been sick. <laughs> I've been sick before with tummy issues. Like I battled SIBO in 2019. So I know when I have like a bacterial infection in my stomach, I, I just know I've been on when I fought, you know, touch me to water. And Danny King dad, I was going, I just finished my rounds of antibiotics when I fought Danny, not Danny, uh, what's his name? Tatsumi Tsuwada. So I know what it's like to be on long string of antibiotics. And I know what happens when my stomach gets hit with bacteria. So I was like, dude, I'm sick. I've been shitting five times, explosive, you know, <laughs> water fountain diarrhea in my butt. And I was like, I'm, I have a bacterial infection. We need to get the hell out of Dodge. So my wife's like, my wife's like, we don't, we don't play games. She goes, I wish we had a private fucking jet. I would love to fly home right now. But yeah. you know, I'm on a net, net level of, of, of financial. So we um, booked a flight, left the next day, and I'm, it's, it, it was worth it. 100% 1 worth it. Refund? Do you get a refund? No, nah, I didn't ask for a refund. Fuck it. All right. Well, as, as long as you're happy <laughs> He said, with fuck it. it. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but by, by the way, what, what I was concerned about was the flight. Like, the, there's nothing worse than having to go to, you know, bathroom on the plane. Uh, how was, was that yeah. troublesome? No, no, no. I, I was by then, I was kind of smart with it. So I went before I jumped on the plane and then we had a layover in LA. And then, yeah, so we, we made it work out. You're just good. Bad. All right. All right. Perfect. Perfect. I'm glad to hear. Um, okay. So, uh, a lot of, uh, by the way, DJ, like you don't have a fight booked, right? I even saw you say like, you're not even thinking about fighting right now. Is this all accurate? There's, there's nothing going on at the moment, correct? Nothing going on right now, but very much in the news you are, which I think is fantastic. You got this <laughs> new show. I was joking about the Henry thing. You kind of no sold me on that. Still love Henry. Yeah. We'll always love Henry, even though he. We're going. You know, you know I, I I gotta fix that bullshit. If anything, I'll bring you on our show. I'll bring you on our show. But like now, Henry, talk to this no, man no. face to face. I would love to. to. I'll come on anytime. Here's the problem. His daddy won't let him have me on. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, his daddy has ha has no say so. What goes on in the goat cast? Right? Uh, this is me and Henry. Uh, it's me and Henry's show, right? So, for us, we want to give the fans. You know, inside of how we think when we break down fights, not just UFC, but one championship, uh, Bellator, boxing. You know, you got Dylan Dennis fighting uh, Logan. Logan Paul. Yeah, Logan Paul. Logan Paul. Um, we we want to just break down all the fights. And I think one of the things that we're talking about, and I sent all the stuff to the producer, Michael, and I'm like, dude, you know, I think it's kind of fascinating to see that, you know, Nate, Nate Diaz technically made 20 million fighting Jake Paul. And it's like, dude, that's that's absolutely amazing. This guy made 20 million more than his whole entire UFC career. If the numbers are true, right? If, if numbers are true, then that's absolutely amazing. Like mm -hmm. give our insight on that to let, you know, the people, the public know, like when an athlete gets the opportunity to do that, they take it. And they don't, you know, if, if Nate Diaz was to take <clears throat> 8 million of that, 8 million of that, pay his taxes. So let's say he pays taxes in his management. He has 10 million left. Let's say he takes 5 million of that and puts in something that's going to give him a, you know, a, a dividend of five, or let's just go 10%. That's, that's extremely high. So I'll say three to five is better. 
10% of 5 million, that's like 500K a year, a year doing nothing, if my math's correct, right? So mm-hmm. that's life changing money right there. It's the same thing Conor McGregor did when he fought Floyd Mayweather. He took some of that money, <clears throat> rolled it in the proper whiskey. Now he's got the proper apple. Now he's got the Irish Forge stout. I mean, he don't have to fight, right? He doesn't have to fight. He just sit back, keep on making the money. It's those are the opportunities that every athlete is looking for. Francis Nagano is about to have it with Tyson Fury. So that, that's the stuff we want to talk about, you know, in the go cast. I love then, you it. You know, Aljamain is talking about going up to, he's tired of cutting weight, right? He's like, I'm done cutting weight. I'll tell you right now, your boy right here is walking around and, whoo, hang on. Uh, yes. 150 this morning. <laughs> I'm like, do I want to go back to 135? Fuck, I look like. I've been working my ass off to put this weight on, this, this muscle on. It's like, I have no interest losing this weight. So just all types of stuff we want to talk about in the show. Okay, this is all tremendous. I have like four follow-ups from just that alone. Yeah, let's do it. When, um, let's do it, babe. What, <clears throat> how, how do you feel about the fact that these guys are making this money, but not in MMA? MMA stars are making this money, but not in the sport in which they are known for. It's it's all these examples are in other sports. Well, boxing. Yeah, I, yeah, I think... I've never been inside a boxing negotiation whatsoever, right? So this would be something we, I would love to hear from Tyron Woodley, Nate Diaz, you know. Francis. We obviously know. I, who? Francis Nagano. Francis. Like, yeah. Francis. So we obviously know, you know, me, Henry, every mixed martial artist out there knows what, you know, UFC, One Championship, PFL, Bellator, those contracts look like, right? But we've never actually got the inside look of like when Nate Diaz comes to the table, Jake Paul's on the other side and he goes, hey, Nate Diaz, hey, this is what I want. Da, 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 da. We don't know how those negotiations go down. So for me, I think it's awesome. It's amazing. Um, I would love to know how that happens, right? Like why do they get more when it comes to boxing instead of mixed martial arts, right? So that's a mystery, a mystery to me, but I would love to know how, 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 how it all happens. To boil it down to its simplest uh, point, it, it, the promotion takes less. In MMA, the promotions take more. In boxing, mm-hmm. the fighters get more, at least the top dogs, right? Um, and, and so that's really what, like, that's why Nate having his real <clears throat> fight ink and Jake having his MVP, like, they yeah, get. They get, yeah. I mean, I, I know how, how I, I know how it all goes down, to be honest. Yeah. You know, there's the one thing that Matt Hume's always, he's always told me, he goes, what the, what the champions need in mixed martial arts is, the Muhammad Ali act, right? Where mm. let's say me and Aljo wanted to fight, right? You have Mighty Mouse MMA LLC. You have Funk Master LLC. Me and him are pretty much the, we are the athletes. Me and him come together and goes, hey, me and Aljo want to fight. Who wants to host it? You have UFC, One Championship, Bellator, PF, PFL, all, all the bigger, Showtime, HBO, Max, or whatever. You know, yeah. HBO is like, dude, we, we want this fight. We'll pay you both $10 million. And, you know, then you got Cinemax and uh, shit. Is Cinemax even around anymore? I don't know. I don't know if it's around, good. but I get what you're saying. It's HBO Max yeah, yeah. Or, the, or it's so, just Max now. Yeah, Max. So each of these companies get to basically lobby to whoever's going to, whoever wants to fight more and pays us the more to zone. And then mean, I'll joke and sit there like, hey, this one sounds good. Let's do 20. They're going to pay us 20. You take 10 to 10 and we'll figure out the rest. That's how it truly happens. But when you're a mixed martial artist, you're locked under their contract, right? Like if I got an offer from, you know, let's say Jake Paul's promotion, he goes, hey, I want you on another car. I want to pay you $6 million, X, Y, and Z. I can't do that because I am contractually obligated under one championship that I can't go do that. I'm sure if I asked Chachi, he's like, hey, man, let me go do this. Chachi's like, yeah, yeah, you know, we'll work something out. We'll let you go do it. But I have to ask for permission instead of, if I was my own entity, which we technically are as a subcontractor, but you have a contract with you know your promotion, I can just do whatever I want. So that's one of the things I learned about Eddie Alvarez. Eddie says, once I sign a contract, I try to figure out the fastest way to get a free agent. And then I try to sign one, one deal contracts because I believe in myself. I bet on myself. And I was like, damn, Eddie, you're right. I need to believe in myself too. So yeah. but How many fights you have left with one, by the way? I don't know. The championship clause. You just extend it, so I, I have no idea. Okay, so no free agency anytime soon. No, 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 no. I, like I said, I think I haven't sparred mixed martial arts since May, maybe hang on, March, April, maybe April. 
Yeah, April was probably last time I did any sparring and mixed martial arts whatsoever. I threw out a joke. Speaking of these crossover fights, there's a boxer named Naoya Inoue. Are you familiar with this mm-hmm. guy? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. He just knocked out. Uh, he just knocked some somebody out. And you Stephen said, Fulton. Yeah, 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 yeah. You said you should fight him. I was like, gee, and it's like, Phew. yeah. Have you can seen I wrestle? I mean, can I? No, there's none of that. But man, just like the speed. I, I was I was joking a little bit, but like I, know, I was just I thinking know. like who, who's the man at that weight and and uh you know who's the man in, in our sport at that weight? That would be insane. But I saw I saw uh like I was looking at your stories on the night of Jake and Nate, and you did this thing, you were in your living room or something, right before I think the last round, the tenth round, and you did this like mm-hmm. little quick breakdown of what Nate needs to do. And I was like, This is incredible. First of all, like your speed, you just going like brrr, but but even like the insight that you were you were sharing. Do you know what I'm talking about? We're showing the video yeah, now. Yeah. Here you are. Yeah. And the stuff is amazing. For for those that may have missed it, we're just gonna show it while you speak. But like you're you're talking about what Nate should do. What could he have done differently in your opinion? Here you are kind of mimicking him, but what could he have done differently to maybe try and pull off that upset? Well, right here, this is me what Jake Paul should have done better, right? Because because Nate Diaz was coming right forward and Jake Paul was doing a good job landing an uppercut, but he never followed up with the uppercut, right? And right there, mm-hmm. you know, I've had amazing coaches <clears throat> in my mixed martial arts career. And so that's just me showing like, you know, Jake Paul should have like pop up and move to the angle and then Nate Diaz is blind, and then he can make Nate Diaz turn into a right hand. And then the other side is I'll show what Nate Diaz was doing is Nate Diaz was doing a good job pressuring Jake Paul, but he wasn't, you know, throwing any stink behind his punches. He was doing more uh, of the pity pat and not really boom, like shifting his weight over. Um, and one of the things, and this is just my upbringing bring with Matt Hume. Matt Hume goes, okay, this guy is not athletic. This guy is athletic. Look the way he shifts his weight. That's an athlete, an athlete ooh, who's explosive and you just pop, 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 and shift this weight. That's just my boxing training when I've done, you know, boxing. And those are the things you don't see really when you see Nate and Jake Paul fight. Like, I think Eddie Hearn said it best. He was like, that fight wasn't, you know, mean. And me and Harry talked about it too. It's like, for me to go into boxing, I respect boxing so much that I know what it takes to be a very good boxer to shift my weight a certain way. When I throw my punches, my punches are just set up my knees, my shot, my my kicks, my elbows. So for me to go from boxing, from mixed martial arts to boxing, I would probably take literally maybe a straight year, a solid year to make sure wow. when I go, I want to make sure I am. Those are the things I'm seeing. Even though Jake Paul has been boxing for so long, he still makes, he still makes, amateur mistakes and his fundamentals, the way he throws his punches aren't at a, honestly, I amateur, his jab is good. He does some things right, but there's still amateur things he does that. It's like, dude, like if I was your coach, I'm like, dude, that shit's garbage. Shit's garbage. Shit is garbage. Like let's get you throwing a hook correctly. Let's get you like, let's build your intelligence, right? Like you're making all this money. That's great. But do you want to be a legit boxer or do you want to just keep making all this fucking money box? Like, what to do? You, what do you want to do? And if if I was Chris, like, hey, this is how you need to read your opponent. You see Nate going like this all the time. You need to step back, pop up, and look. He's gonna swing. There's your right hand. You you throw punches to create the opening instead of trying to look for the opening. You're never gonna find the opening because you're looking for it. You got to pop, 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 pop. That's your opening right there. So I don't know. He's got great coaches, but for me as uh an analyst, an athlete, those are the things I see. And that was just a little breakdown that I like to do. But, you know, you break shit down. People are like, oh, you you talking shit. Da, 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 da. And I'm like, dude, I'm not perfect. I make mistakes all the time when I fight. I've been knocked out, you know, but I've also done a lot of amazing things in my career. For sure. By the way, is there something to be said for just like the age at which he picked this all up? Like, is it almost maybe impossible no. for him? No, 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 no. no. No, no, because uh, Jake Paul never went through the broke athlete phase. When I mean bright broke athlete phase is that when I was a professional athlete, I was working 40 hours a week, you know, driving to the gym, doing CrossFit, driving to the other gym. He's never had to go through that broke phase. He, he came to the sport with money. So he's got the best access to the best trainers, best nutritionists, best of whatever he needs. It's just him taking the time of like, hey, I'm going to work on this and going to get actual rounds, joining a gym and, and doing classes and going to actual boxing gym. It's like, hey, guys, we're going to spar. 
I want you guys to beat my ass. No ego here. Let's go. Like, w- tell me what I'm doing wrong, right? I don't know if he's going through that, right? He might mm. say he is, but I find that very hard to believe because some of these guys get egos and they don't want none of, none of that, that stuff to get out. But it's like, dude, you know, just go out there and just go to the gym, take classes. How to go one, two, three, t- t- tap, 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 cross, take the angle, six, three, another angle, body shot up, you watch your point and he swings, boom, you hit him. I don't know if he's doing stuff like that. I love this shit. I could watch you do this stuff all day. <laughs> it's, it's so effortless for you. There's something about it that is fascinating. In fact, along those lines, a video surfaced yesterday of Terrence Crawford. You know Terrence Crawford, right? Arguably yes, the sir. Best yes, boxer sir. On the pl- did you see this video of him wrestling out on the I lawn? Did. Can we play this video and, and you just break down this man's skills? This is Terrence Bud Crawford, whose sons wrestle, who has a bit of wrestling in his background, just yeah. messing around. This is the best boxer on the planet. What is he doing right here? What is he doing wrong? So he's basically keeping the, the right distance. He has that taller, he has that collar tie, and he's keeping his balance very well. And then so that guy got in on an underhook, and right there, that guy tried to go for a sweep as well. But Terrence is he has great balance, right? His balance has never been compromised. But he, he has never taken an actual shot to compromise his balance. So right now, he's just doing a good job of keeping his balance. Like his posture is not broke. The other guy's posture is way broke because he's trying to initiate. But if I was the other guy, he needs to do better hand fighting. Terrence is controlling the hand fighting way better. And his posture, and he's throwing his shoulder in there. See, now Terrence is trying to go there. And boom, see right there, Terrence, if you were to step in deep. But yeah, his, his balance is way better than the other guy. Way better. Way better. Does this, so does this was, surprise you? No, he's athletic. He understands balance. Like half, 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 you know, as they say in the gym, that's we call that black addicts. It's a black man that's athletic. That's what they call it in the gym. But um, he, he understands balance. But like to what the other guy needs to do, he needs to disturb Terrence's balance, right? He's not disturbing his balance. And he needs to hand fight more, arm drag, pull, pull Terrence's head down. He's never pulling Terrence's head down whatsoever. Mm. Like, Terrence's posture is always good right there. He's, his, his balance is great. That's a person who's got great balance. That's why the gentleman's having a hard time getting him because his balance has never been compromised. This is great shit. This is the type of shit that I want to see from <laughs> you and Henry Cejudo breaking this type of stuff down. But but come on, like for a bo- boxers don't know how to do this stuff. This is very rare for a boxer of his caliber to even know these types of fundamentals. Would you not say? Well, he's... Well, he's one of the best in the world, so I'm sure he's done some type of form of... Re- you said his kids wrestle? Yeah, his kids wrestle. Yeah, so I'm sure him and his kids have played, and so when you're around it and you see it, and it's okay, I keep my balance, right? Keep my balance. I was working with a, a gentleman at the gym, and I said, I saw him, he's doing all this cage fighting. He was like, he was like, Ugh, this, he was doing all this cage fighting. I was like, what the hell are you doing? He goes, I'm trying to fight off the cage. I was like, I was like, take me down. And I was just like this. You take me down yet? Take me down. Take me down. And he couldn't take me down. And he, he was like, what are you doing? I was like, I'm just keeping my balance. I was like, once you compromise my balance, I will, I will address my balance. And once I address my balance, then I'll go back to just chilling. Let you burn all this energy. And then when you burn on your energy, here comes the knee to the liver. Then here comes the elbow. And then I'm going to shift level. So it's just years of me training with Matt. And now training Professor John, understanding the way the body moves and ju- judo, jujitsu, and the gi, just, yeah. So it's just years, years of training. Eight, 10 months. Can Jake Paul beat Nate Diaz in an MMA fight? No. All Nate has to do is go down to a pro guard and then, then Jake Paul's in no man's land, right? I know Jake Paul, he has, he's athletic, he can wrestle, but mixed martial arts is totally different. It's totally different. All right, so you're not crossing over to boxing anytime soon. By the way, uh, is that like a bucket list thing for you, or nah, like you don't have to? Nah, do, no, I, I okay. like having all my, I like having all my tools. Like I feel that's one piece of the game that I love the kick, I love the knee, I love the wrestle, I love to clinch. So for me, you know, when I saw Luke Rocco's fight Mike Perry, I was like, dog, you just traded in your best fucking weapons. That beautiful yeah. question mark kick you got, that jujitsu you got, you just trade that shit in for just your hands. You fucking crazy. And he's going up against Craig Jones in Israel, of all yeah. places, next month. Did you see that? I did. I did. It's a grapp- grappling match, I believe. Yeah. I'm, I'm a, yeah. I, you know, you got, you got GSP about the grapple. I mean, it's good, right? Like, why not? 
Why exactly. Not? And that, that leads me to you because you announced recently that you're going to be competing in the 2023 IBJJF Masters World Championship in Las Vegas, August 31st to September 2nd. You're competing. Is 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 this the first? By the way, this is correct. Yes. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, a, why are you doing this? And B, when's the last time, if ever, you competed in a high level competition like this, as far as grappling is concerned? So, for people out there, this would be my first time ever competing in a level. Wow. Last time, last time I done a jujitsu tournament was I was 18 years old. <laughs> wow, that is wild. You um, just turned 37, right? It's almost 20 years yeah, ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. So for me, the reason why one, my son does Brazilian jiu-jitsu, um, he loves it. He's gonna be down there competing, and he asked me, he goes, Dad, why don't you compete? And I was like, Well, I was like, Why don't I? And so you know, I try to do it under the under the radar. You know, I signed up. Didn't hmm. tell anybody. Only, there was only a couple people who knew. My wife, um, Professor Jan, and you know Matt knew that I was going to be doing it. And then next thing you know, I'm doing an interview. And then it, boom, blasts out. And Destiny goes, what do you think was going to happen? Babe, you have yeah. to understand, you're not just a normal athlete. You, you're not just a normal athlete. You didn't think people were going to find out. And I was like, Honestly, I was hoping I was going to show up to the tournament, just jump on his, you know, thinking like, Demetri Johnson, like, what the fuck's he doing here? I'm like, just want to grapple, see how, see how I do, see where I'm at. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a challenge. It's a 38 man bracket. So I'll probably get five to six matches. So I'm excited, man. Damn. I haven't felt butterflies, uh, anxiousness in a very, very long time. Very long time. Really? Even after oh, the Morris yeah. knockout, all that. Oh, yeah. Raw tang. Yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, raw tang, yeah, I, I I got anxious and you know butterflies, but and then the second Ryan fight, you know, I felt like once I hit the uh, raw tang fight, I felt like I hit a new level of like my vision and like being in the moment, like being there. And then Ryan's fight, like when I you know hit him and I saw him fall down, I was like, oh shit, I know what this is. Oh, look at that! Blah, through the knee, I was like, yeah, and I walked off. And then the third fight was like, okay, here we are. We're here again. Blah, blah. Mm hmm. Yep. Got it. Oh, he's shooting. No, <laughs> look at you cheating, grabbing the inside of my glove. Look at you. And then, you know, I'm knee him. I look at Matt like, he didn't like that, did he? he I'm, I'm like at a level where, where it's like, I don't know. It's just like I've been in, I'm in a different level where I'm, I can see things as they break down now. So we're in the past, like I'll just black out. I remember what happens, but I couldn't, I wasn't in the pilot seat. That makes sense. It was all reaction in you know, training. Now it's like, no, nah, I'm in there. Like it's, it's, it's me fighting. So with jujitsu, it's a little bit different because I want to see where I'm at. And then when I jumped in the gi, it was for me to take away my athletic ability and learn how to deal with the grips and use the grips. And I feel this is the only way for me to see where I'm at by going to master worlds and just, just to see where I'm at. Like, it's like, Hey, it's 38 man bracket. I'm going out there, do my best. And yeah, see what happens. And uh, what is the age? Like how so old do you I have missed, to be to enter this? Yeah, so I'm master's two. I missed the adult one. Adult is 18 to 30, right? So that's okay. That happened, in, that happened in July. And I didn't know about that one. So this one, I believe the cutoff is once you hit 30 years old, you're considered master's one. And I think it was from 30 to maybe 34 is master one. And then from masters two is 35 to maybe 38. Then it goes there, then there, then there, then there. Okay. So um, that, that's the cutoff. But my goal is potentially next year, how I feel, I might try to do the 18, the 30 years old, the adult, just to see where I'm at. Right? Like, it's, as an athlete... Wait, how could you do 18 in, to 30 if you're 37? You can still enter. Oh, that's right. You can still enter that, but I have to go around and gather points. So I'll have to oh, travel okay. to different different wow. um what i've been told you have to have points in order to get there when you're a masters you don't need points you just get to walk right in and you're competing with other people around there so i'm still getting new information about how all this this world works i guess you can say but yeah so that's how it works as far as i know by the way gi, gi or no gi i'm a gi guy like no gi okay. for me is like the stuff that you can do in gi is just absolutely amazing. Amazing. Like the shit I learned the other day, you know, 
Professor Yama was like, okay, if he's going to grab his gi, you can lock his hand down, jump around and, and choke him out with the lapel. And then if he's going to defend that, then you can do a, a bolo and get his back. And then you have this arm locked. And I'm just like, dude, this is like, I love the complexity of what the gi brings to the game to where when I am in no gi, I am so athletic. I can just sh shut shit down where it's like, even, you know, guys who are 185, I'm like, you can't, you can't pass my guard because you can't grab handles. You can't grab my legs. I can just move underneath you. So the gi just brings so much more complexity to the game that I am fascinated by. And are you aware of any other famous fighters or anything in, in your 30 man, 38 man bracket? No, I have no, no, no. Even, you like, do you even know who you're facing? Nope. And I love it. You love it. No prep, no homework, no nope. tape study. Nope. Why do you love that? Fresh. It, the reason why I love that is because it, it tests the true martial artist. And what I mean mm -hmm. by that, when I was an amateur in mixed martial arts, you know, Matt was like, hey, we got to fight in two months against this guy. Will we go out there and surf the internet and try to find information on how he fights? No, right? Now, the amateurs, right? They're like, oh, I'm fighting this guy in two months. I'm going to look at all this information and break him down. And all that stuff. I was like, you're a fucking amateur. You're, you're an amateur. This is the time where you learn how to address certain situations under their pressure. And so for me, that was one of the things I hate about fighting, you know, professionally. It's like, hey, you're fighting Adriano again, right? For the third time. And I felt that it stopped my growth as an athlete. And people were like, why, why, why do you say that? And I was like, because you're, you're fixated on one person for eight weeks on how you're going to beat this person. Instead of like, I'm just going to grow as a martial artist in eight weeks and whatever he brings to the table, I should be able to address that. So for me, going to the tournament, it's like, I don't care who I'm going against. I got to make sure my balance is good. My cardio is good. And I don't make any mistakes. I should be able to beat everybody in the world that way. And if I get exposed to something new, then I have to address that. And then I go back to the, to the office and be like, hey, I got caught in this worm guard. How do we address the worm guard? Or we got caught in you know the spider guard. How do we address that? So when I go out and I train with different people in the E, I roll with this two... I think he was like 210 pound black belt. Holy shit. Whoa. He put me in some, he put me in some stuff. I was like, what the fuck? And he, he goes, I'm also bigger. I'm longer. So I can, you know, do certain things to you. But it's exposure that he did to me that it's like, okay, I've been exposed to that. How do I deal with this? So that's my rant on like why I feel a lot of athletes don't get good anymore. It's because they're so fixated on, oh. I'm about to fight this guy. Let's just watch tape for eight months and see what he does well. Then we'll just you know, do X, Y, and Z, and we should beat them. Instead of like, hey, this is where we're fighting. We're not going to watch any tape. We're just going to be the best, you know, Demetrius Johnson eight weeks out or fight night. Right. Uh, so no tape study going up against guys who are over 200 pounds. It feels to me like you're also preparing for the Bradley Martin super fight here because <laughs> <laughs> what is going on here? Can you explain to me what's going on here? Because there I am on Instagram oh, and God. Sports Center, the Sports Center page is posting like this thing that has like 500,000 views on it of you and Brad. What is, I, I'll be honest with you. And I'm not sure. Like people thought I was playing some sort of character when I was talking about Bryce Hall on, on Monday, the, the, the TikTok guy who had a BKFC fight. I'm honestly not aware of these characters and I'm not trying to make myself seem like the old guy or above them. I'm just, yeah. So Bradley Martin, I, I think I first found out about him with the Nate clip where he was talking about a street fight with Nate. And then I see something with you and the thing with you seems to have gathered a lot of steam. Is this actually happening, you versus Bradley Martin? So then I'll break down the full what's going on. So okay. I never knew who Bradley Martin was until Brennan Schaub did that interview with him. And, you know, he has this thing where he goes, I bet you I'd be in a street fight. Let's, let's stop right there. A street fight. What is technically a street fight? Ask yourself that. Everybody out there who's watching this, ask yourself, what is a street fight? I know what a street fight is. A street fight is anything goes. I had a buddy who got jumped by five fucking dudes. Guess what he carries on him now? He pulled the shirt up and he had two fucking daggers in his, in, in his butt line. I said, dude, what is that? He goes, I got jumped. He goes, I wish a motherfucker would try to fight me in a street fight. They're getting, that, 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 that. They're getting jabbed up. Or mm -hmm. is a person carrying a gun? Does he have a bat? Like what is technically like in the realm of a street fight? What is a street fight? 
So I think that's a good question for Bradley Martin to answer because he asked everybody, you think you beat me in a street fight? What is a street fight? Okay, move forward. So Brandon Schaub says you can't, you know, beat the elites of, you know, the smaller people. I truly believe that. I've seen Bibiana Fernandez, which is the 135 pound champ, former champ. I've seen him roll up Tim Boach. Tim Boach is a big gentleman. I think he was probably like two... 215 when they grappled and he rolled him the fuck up because the technique and he knows how to move the body. So when I heard this, I said, dude, I told Brandon, Brandon messaged me. He goes, Hey man, I hope it's okay. I kind of brought you into this, into this, you know, debate. I was like, yeah, dude, it's all good. And I was like, dude, I'll come down there and grapple him. Like I have no problem going down there, grapple him and show him what's up. And he goes, okay, okay, okay. I'm gonna let him know. So Brandon goes back and tells him, he goes, Hey, I talked to the mighty mouse. He said he's down. He's got a couple of things to take care of first, which I do. I was just in Mexico. I have Worlds. I have Bibiano's gym. His gym is opening. So I have other prior obligations I want to attend to first. But I would love to go down there and just grapple him. It's no animosity. It's like, hey, dude, Demetri Johnson, Bradley Martin, let's go. Come on. Show me what you got, big man, big muscle man. What you, what you, what you fucking going to do, mate? You do fucking nothing, mate. Just go out there and play. Now... Everybody and their fucking mom <laughs> has taken it to a level. Oh, they about to fight. If it was an MMA fight, dog, I'm I'm fucking your liver up. I I hope you I hope you spear tackle me because then you you just cross all the distance. You're in my clinch. You're in my elbows. You're in my grappling realm. Like you see, uh, Shane Willie pick up French Nagano. He's two ninety three, mm. right? Okay. Mm. All right. I, I'm a fucking man, right? And I weigh one hundred fifty pounds. You can be 260. I can still pick you up because I know how to get underneath my wit, my hips, and lift you up. So what turned to be, a, it was, and it still might, right? Everybody wants to get their hands on it. You got my my good friend, Henry Sejudo, saying, oh, DJ, D Demetrius, you, you got to get paid, man. It's all good and stuff. But, you know, you got to secure the bag, brother. You got everybody and their mom trying to get hands on it. It's like, it almost turns into something that was supposed to be fun. Now she's like blowing out of proportion. So we'll see what happens. I know it's going to happen, right? I want it to happen. It's just finding the right way to navigate it. And yeah. I mean, we're looking at the uh, the tail of the tape right now. It's ridiculous. You're five foot three. He's <laughs> six foot three. You say you weigh 150. <laughs> He's like 260 something. It's absolutely absurd. Although I would bet my entire life savings on you in whatever. Don't do that. Don't, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. Why? You put it in the SAT 500 and you, you'll no. make, because, because anything can happen. You know, he can no spirit talk chance. to me. I blow my fucking rib. I There's mean, no the chance. biggest thing, the biggest thing about this whole logistics is proving that just because you're big doesn't mean you can beat somebody who's smaller. Yes. If I wasn't a trained athlete, then yeah, he would absolutely destroy me. But I've been spending the last 18 years, not 18, 20 years of my fucking life dealing with people who are bigger than me, right? Like, it's like, this is like my realm I deal with every single day of my life. When was the last time he wrestled somebody who was fucking 300 pounds or 280, 290? He hasn't. This I, I dealt with this my whole entire life. So when somebody says, I'm bigger than you, I can beat you. I'm like, okay, this is, I just dealt with this two days ago. Come on, let's see what you can do. So for me, it's this is like everyday occurrence in my life, right? So have you talked to him? That's no, I have not talked to him. No DMs, no nothing. No, 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 no. Brennan Schaub is the middleman. He, he's kind of okay. the promoter in this. So I mean, okay. if me, if, you know, and that's what I mean. Like, imagine if me and Bradley Martin were our own entities, which we are. If I was like, hey, let's do it on. Who wants who wants to get this grapple match, right? It's oh my god, yeah. yeah so yeah, would, so Brandon, would one uh, be Brandon okay with you doing this? Uh, we'll see. That's that's the thing. We, we got to figure all that out. But for me, that's what I mean. Like it was supposed to be some fun for just yeah, just going to grapple. Like I have no animosity. It's I'm just trying to prove it. It's like hey, you know, Mikey Misumichi's beat people. I, I saw a tournament where he did it in in, in a, he fought a guy who was like 300 plus pounds and he rolled him up. He beat him. Right, because it's grappling, right? So we'll see. Like it's going to happen, regardless if it's. I, I want it. It's. It's. It was supposed to happen and just be fun. Now it turns into like a business opportunity, where it's like I never wanted it to be a business opportunity. I wanted to just go out there and prove that 
smaller people who are trained and athletic can beat somebody who's 260 and lift weights. That's all it's supposed to be. Now you got to be a mom trying to mm-hmm. tune into it. Uh, and and so you do think though that it is going to happen? Come, I don't, I don't hell know. Or high. I you said you it, just said it, it's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, it's going to happen regardless if it's under any promotion. Like it does. I don't. I'm not looking to gain anything out of this. I would rather it just be me going down there and grappling him and creating content, and then mm-hmm. jumping on this podcast. I'm like, yeah, dude, like you're 260. I'm sure with some training. Or shit, I might get down there and he might just fucking lay on me the whole time. Then I'm like, well, I can't move your big ass weight. Like, I'm just going out there to show something. I don't, it was never supposed to be what it is today. Like, when it happened, I was like, hey, I'll I'll come down there and grapple you. Like, I have no problem with that. I have no ego. Like, I'll come down there and grapple you, see what you can do, and then go from there. It would be fascinating to watch just given the uh, the size difference and your skill set and your... I mean, just like your 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 wealth of knowledge and experience when it comes to this, and then he has the advantage of just being gigantic. Um, mm-hmm. So let's see, that would be fascinating. Uh, by the way, uh, Aljo, Sean O'Malley, who do you like? It's hard. Like it's it, that's that's a fascinating fight. I think Aljo has the advantage of fighting higher caliber athletes. His grappling is. I would give the strength advantage to Aljo. Um, I give the striking advantage or rhythm advantage way more to Sugar Sean O'Malley. So if Aljo walks across distance, like he's been doing against everybody else, what he did to Peter Young, what he's done to Henry Cejudo, when he's done to everybody, which he will do against Sugar Sean O'Malley, he's got to make sure he gets his hands on him. Like if he tries to make it a kickboxing fight and striking fight, his chance of getting knocked out knocked out, go up significantly higher, right? But mm-hmm. if he goes across the cage and just gets his hands on O'Malley, I haven't seen O'Malley have a good clinch game. Um, he's got some good takedown defense, but, you know, Aljo took down my boy Henry Cejudo. So it's it, it it's a tough fight, but if I had to pick somebody, like if I was on a desk and I'm like, they had a, you know, like if you have to pick somebody and you're getting fired, I'll probably pick Aljo because he's been through uh, tough fights. I think mm-hmm. he's just fought higher caliber guys. You should be on a desk somewhere. Your 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 insight is amazing. On uh, on Friday, uh, Al Jermaine had a uh, a media day at his gym on Long Island, and he was asked about you. I don't know if you if you saw this, but here's the quote. I just wanted to get your response if I could. <laughs> uh, someone asked him about fighting you. Quote: He's too little, man. Mighty Mouse is great, but he's too little. There's a reason why he lost to Dominic Cruz. It wasn't skill deficiency. It's size. If size didn't matter, I think skill for skill, he's better than Dom. But when you get a guy who can pick you up and just take you to the ground over and over, I think that's a hard task. He's skilled, but I think father time has passed him a little bit. If he wants this work, try to get some revenge for Henry. I can beat your boy too. So Mighty Mouse, where are you at? So, your thoughts? So this is, this is what I love about MMA, right? It's because, <laughs> yes, in the past, I did have trouble dealing with guys who are bigger than me. Right. I, when I look back at my Dom fight, I felt that I wasn't ready for that fight. Like my skill level now to fight bigger dudes, like I, the size of, I mean, Adrian was 5'9, right? 5'9 or 5'8. I've dealt mm-hmm. with bigger guys, especially fighting in one championship with Tatsumi Tsuwada. What's the other gentleman's name? Yuya Wakamatsu and Adriano. I've dealt with the bigger guys. And so now, like Aljo and other guys, like dude, let's 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 play spar. Let's let's come spar, and I'm gonna I would love to, I would love to grapple you. I would love to just move and see how you just do your thing. Um, but I I feel his weakness is he has no clinch game. Like I would eat his ass up for breakfast in the clinch game. Um, I feel like rhythm wise, like bah, 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 like that, I move way better than he does in the feet. Um, grappling, he is longer. So I would never let him get my fucking back because he'll lock he'll lock them fucking funk master legs up in a body triangle like he did to Peter Yon, and I'll have to survive him doing that. Um, I feel like his shot. I feel like my balance now and my clinch game will give his 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 shot getting getting close. The one thing he does that helps to my advantage is that he crosses the distance for me. Right? He he does this this shit right here mm. and mm-hmm. a funky ass kick, and I'm like perfect. <laughs> Come here. I want to show you a thing called Muay Thai clinch. I'm going to show it to you. 
right? Where it's like, I, I just feel like I'll eat him alive in a clinch. He is very, very good. Like I told Henry, when me and him are training together, I'm like, Henry, like if don't, Henry loves to play borders, right? When you play borders, you're constantly, you're constantly changing the distance, but you're not getting the angle off him because he comes straight in. I was like, Henry, if you, and me and him, I've been trying to help Henry develop his clinch game. If Henry had a better clinch game in that fight, and if Henry was more savvy and grappled more, when, when Aljo did that shot and he failed the shot attempt and he stayed down as a grounded opponent and Henry hit his head, head there, I said, Henry, you circle around that motherfucker and you make him get up. You put your hooks in. You start the grappling exchange. You you got to you got to grapple. And so when I grab when I went down at uh, Arizona Combat Sport, I was like, Henry, we're gonna spend a day just grappling. Like, let's just grapple. We don't have to worry about borders. We don't have to worry about this stuff. I want you to be ready because it's gonna be a grappling match. Don't worry about that. Just get your grappling going, right? So, yeah, I love that fight with me and Aljo. Like, if it was to happen, like. Yes, I am 37. I am old. Now I understand. But, you know, I, I still feel not, like my Not that much older than him, by the way. Not that much, Just a few years older than him. I think three or so. Oh, okay. Yeah, so his ass getting old too. Um, <sighs> but yeah, I, I think the biggest thing that he uh, poses a threat to my game is one, his size, which I've dealt with in the past, and just him being long. And if he got on my back, I would be in trouble. Like I told Henry, I was like, Henry, if he gets your back, you're in fucking trouble. Like he's going to lock you up and... And here was like, I'm going to take the round off and I'm going to get back to work in the next round. So, but yeah, I, I have nothing but respect for uh, respect for Aljo. Love what he's done in his career. I'm happy he's finally get the shine that he's getting mm -hmm. now because he's worked extremely hard. He's been very humble. He's done the right thing. He's passed all his drug tests. Yeah, I, I'm excited for him and Sugar Sean O'Malley uh, Saturday night. Do you think he can be successful at 145? Yeah, I think so. I don't think he beat Bulk. Um, I think Bulk is probably right now probably one of the best fighters who's just like every single time he he fights, I'm like, he's getting better. He's getting better. Mm. He's getting better. Like he his IQ is extremely high and he's super athletic too. Uh, last time, by the way, that we spoke, you said, uh, and I'll let you go in a second. You said that, um, you know, you're, you're, you're thinking about retirement, this, that, and the other. Uh, it's been a few months. Have you thought more about the end? Do you, yeah. Any any sort of? Oh, you have. Yeah, I thought about. I thought about more. Um, it, it, right now, it's just something that it hasn't interested me. Right, like I said, I haven't sparred since April. Yeah, April. And that's how I do my my fight camps. It's like I don't I don't need to spar. I don't. Need to, I'm not gonna go spar. I'm not gonna go train. I'm just so focused on e grappling and and grappling in general that. I don't know if MMA has been exciting me lately. So we'll see. I haven't made an official decision, but I've been still pondering. It's like, I just not, it's not exciting. Yeah. It's just not exciting to me right now. And I don't want to, I don't want to fight just to make money because as I talk to GSP, he says, Demetrius, there is, there's always going to be another guy. There's plenty of ways to make money, plenty of ways. So I, I had my talk with him and picked his brain and he can, he could have still compete. Um, so I'm, I'm still sitting down digesting it right now. It's, you know, I'm going to do worlds. Then I'm going to sit back at the worlds. I'm like, Hey, what, what do I want to do? Right. I'm still healthy. Do I want, do I want to do another mixed martial arts fight? Do I want to keep on competing in the gi? So right now, even after I fought Adrian Marias, I told myself, okay, I'm going to start lifting up my calorie intake, up my protein, and I want to walk around about 148, 150 because the weight class I'm going into is 154. I, I could have gone 141, but I'm like, I'm tired of fucking cutting weight. Like, I'm always cutting weight. I mean, cutting weight since I was in middle school. I'm done. Like, I'm stopping my body growing into a man. So once I beat Adrian on the third time, I was like, okay, I'm going to start lifting weights. And then I started lifting weights, kept on eating, started putting 150 grams of protein in my, my body, carbs to the roof, the fats. And then now it's like, no, nah, I didn't even have to try. I wake up like 149. I'm like, hell yeah. Hell yeah. So we'll, we'll see, man. Like it, it's not official, but it's right now my focus is on geek grappling and worlds. After that, we'll, we'll sit down with the wife. I'm like, hey, you know, what do you think? And the thing that makes me not mad, it, it's just that I don't need to fight. I don't want to fight for money. If it doesn't appeal to me, then it's like, I'm good. I just, 
And then the only time somebody, and I'll say this, the matchmaker did ask me, he goes, what fight excites you right now? I was like, Aljamar Sterling. He goes, well, that'll yeah. never happen. I was like, well, there's, there's a complexity to his game that I feel like I can solve it. Um, and he's the big dog over here in America. I'm the big dog over in Asia. So a lot of people think I've retired already because they haven't seen my fights in one, in one championship. So for me, it's like, that's a big dog here in this yard. He's a big dude. He gets to 185, 170, whatever, he, how fat he gets. And it's like, I'd love to have that. If that was brought to me as an as a opportunity, it would be like, okay, that's a problem that I feel like I can solve, that I would love to solve. I would, I would put myself through a training camp for that fight, right? Mm. But as time goes on, it goes on, it goes on. I get more uh, pulled away from mixed martial arts for my project, the GOAT cast, other, other projects that are going on. It's like, I don't need to do mixed martial arts. I'm more focused on these projects because I can do these projects till I'm 85 or 90. My window of opportunity of fighting is slowly closing. And there's so much fucking red tape and other stuff you have to go through just to make it happen. As far as the Bradley Martin, he's like, I was just going to book a ticket to Calabasas. You got Henry like, no, no, you got to get paid. It's like, I just want to fucking go do things. Like, So that's what excites me about the grappling tournament because it's like, it's just something I can just go do and do and then come back home and do my own thing. There's no buildup. There's no media tour. There's none of this other stuff. So, but yeah, I'm going to stop there. I can go on all day. Is there a chance though that you have fought your last MMA fight? Oh yeah, 1,000%. Wow. Yeah, when I told, where would you when put I, that at I right now? The, if 100% is you're done, where are you at right now in terms of not fighting ever again? Let's just say this. When I told people that this could be my last fight against Adrian Ryan, I was not bullshit. That was not no, that was not no tactic to get people to watch. Like I was dead ass serious. Like the amount of wow. how much I trained for that fight and then coming out for the walkout and having my kids there and the emotions I had, hearing all my my name being chanted. And I'm just like, dude, like this is a huge emotional, like, ugh. And I told myself, I need to force myself that, yes, I can keep on fighting and make lots of money, but I need to force myself to find other ways to make money. I'm relying on my body to make money, right? And I told myself, I was like, I need to figure out another way to make money, right? And I, and I was laying in bed, and I was like, if I had $5 million in the bank account, this is during the Adrian camp. I love how Dana White says, oh, man, if an athlete's thinking about retiring, he should just fucking retire. Hey. Like... I, I was early in bed and I was like, if I had $5 million in cash, would I fight Adrian Ramirez? So I was like, no, nah, I don't really need to. I don't really care to. I just, yeah. And so, but I still went through the camp. I still trained, showed up, did all the work, went out there, beat him. And then after the fight, I was like, okay, I guess that was it. All right, let's, uh, let's figure out something else. Oh, jujitsu sounds fun. Can I get, can I gain, you know, eight pounds or 10 pounds of muscle? I'm going to find out. Let's see. So I've been on this journey of uh, this journey. So we'll see what my journey is after this, this grappling tournament. And then we'll go from there. I, I hope you don't think I'm fishing and I'm really trying not no. to like pry. No, 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 and no. I've kept you way too long here. But the thing is, DJ, that I hope, I don't even know you understand. You're one of the top five greatest fighters in the history of MMA. And I feel like you're just casually telling us even more so than you did back in April that this could be it for you in just like a throwaway last question of this interview. And my, I feel like my my head is like the emoji with the fire coming out of it. I'm like, is DJ <laughs> retiring in front of us here? What's going on? No, like no, you, no, This no, feels no, a no, lot no, more no. definitive. It feels a lot more definitive than in April, if I'm being honest. Yeah. Yeah, no, when I when I officially retire, I, I mean, there's so much stuff I can just, that I haven't fully divulged yet. But when I oh, officially I do it, like I'll give every ounce of it and like why I'm deciding to do that. But okay. I, I like to leave the door open just because just just in case something comes in front of me that seems interesting, that it's okay. I, I would love to do that. Like let's let's fucking do it. Even my wife is the same way. She goes, she's like, she goes, I support whatever you want to do. Like you can fight again, but she is like, I I just I have my husband. You're 37. You can walk. You're healthy. You have no brain trauma. You're still beautiful. Like I don't want to see my husband get. You made yeah. out, right? And I and I even talked to Matt about this, share my feelings, and you know we've had good discussions too. So it just comes apart in time in an athlete's career that you know you have these discussions, you have these talks, and I've had these thoughts even before fighting Adrian on the third time. It's just how much 
how why do I have to keep it's just a lot of stuff. So I get it. Yeah, but you're not playing. There, I'm just being straight. Go ahead. No, no, and I appreciate it immensely. Is there a point where you say, like, come 38, I have to make a decision? Like, I don't want to be out for too long, or will it just all be a feeling thing? If it comes to it, it would just it would just be feeling game because all through I know that I would never lose uh like I talked to another athlete. He goes, dude, how do you go so long without sparring? He goes, I feel like if I don't spar, I feel like I lose my step. And I was like, then you, you got to find that, 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 that balance. But all through COVID-19, I didn't train at all. And then I was like, maybe what, eight, nine, 10 months off. So for me, it's, I'm still, I'm still working on my craft. If that makes sense. Right? I'm still grappling. I'm still doing all this stuff and working on my game. So it just has to make sense for me to get passion to go to go in through another eight to twelve week camp, it has to it has to get me up, right? Like mm-hmm. if it doesn't get me up, then it, it's not worth my time. I I that's just how I feel. Like it's not worth my time. I rather I rather work on YouTube. I rather work on the podcast. I rather work on other stuff than relying on my body to go out there and make a paycheck. If that makes sense. Hundred percent. And there's nothing left for you to prove. Uh, other than the Naoya Inoue super fight, which would be a great you know, <laughs> challenge for you. <laughs> um, oh, well, that is Lord. fascinating stuff. That is fascinating stuff. I, I've kept you way too long. Uh, thank you so much, as always. This was tremendous. Happy belated birthday. I hope you feel better. Good luck in just a couple of weeks' time in Las Vegas. And, uh, you know, you did say one time, well, you know, you're going to retire. When you retire, you're going you're to do it, you know, in a coffee shop telling your wife that's it we're done you're going to do it as eddie alvarez told you he would do it but please do come on the show as well and talk to us about it okay now that you got your own podcast don't be one of those guys who's like oh i got my own show i don't have to go on other people's shows all right don't be that guy all right no 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 no. i'll suit it like i said when i was in new york with you like me have an opportunity to come on your show and 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 just speak where our mindset is at promote you know the go cast everybody out there make sure you go follow the go cast the first podcast where you have so much gold on the mic Triple C, flyweight champion, defending the belt, bantamweight champion, defending the belt. Do not forget, ladies and gentlemen, he is a gold Olympic medal champion wrestler. Then you have me, yes. moi, 15 times <laughs> mixed martial arts champion, world Grand Prix champion, longest reigning ever consecutive UFC champion, and also the current one flyweight champion. There has never been so much acc- you know, accolades, credentials under one podcast. Do yourself a favor, go subscribe to the channel. The Goat Cast. Yeah, so I got a lot of shit going on, but I always go on other podcasts, uh, not podcasts, but other shows, just promote and just, you know, let people know what I'm thinking. Much love. Uh, good luck with the show. You guys are doing great stuff. Good luck with the competition. Thanks as always, DJ. Appreciate the time. Appreciate it, man. Oh, next episode is uh, this Monday, April, no, August 21st. So make sure you tune in. All right, right after 292. Thanks, DJ. There he is. Uh, Mighty Mouse, Demetrius Johnson, tremendous stuff there. What insight. Oh my gosh. I mean, that was a lot more definitive than, you know, when we spoke to him before the Marais fight in New York and then after the Marais fight. Sounds like a guy that unless they bring him something super interesting, he's done. And really, what else is there, right? Like, what else is there for him to, to do at this point? He's done it all. He's fought them all considering what he can do and who he can fight and who's at his disposal. Uh, there isn't a ton there. Him versus Funkmaster would be tremendous, tremendous stuff, but we know that's not going to happen in this sport because uh, there are, you know, rarely co-promotions, although the UFC and one did have that very uh, famous trade back in the day. One of the first stories that I broke for ESPN way back when. So perhaps they have a good relationship where they'll do it. Something tells me they won't, but that would be incredible stuff. Um, wow. Okay. Uh, great stuff there. That was riveting. And now it's time to answer some questions. Shall we time now for everyone's favorite segment of the week? It is time. It's time for a good old fashioned Q and a MMA fans. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, the moment has arrived to hear from the man himself, Ariel Helwani. Live from the Vox Studios in beautiful New York City, And now, to answer your questions, get out of your seats and on your feet, because here he is, Ariel Helwani! 
I think my big takeaway from all of that is uh, I really need to up my my video camera game. I mean, DJ puts me to shame. Um, and the microphone. What's wrong with my microphone? I think my microphone I mean, is great. Better. Is it really? Yeah. I disagree. You have the MV7. He's got the SV7. If, if I had to start, if I had to start with one, camera has to be updated, right? Yeah. Upgraded, updated. Yeah. All right. Um, what a guy. Uh, what happened to my questions? Oh, here they are. Okay, here we go. Um, number one, Connor from Canada. Hi, Ariel. Can you explain what is going on with the class action lawsuit against the UFC that is now allowing fighters to sue? Seems like a big deal that isn't really being discussed. Thanks. Okay, so it's not... I mean, this has been ongoing for 10 years, but last uh, last week was a big step uh, for that class action lawsuit. And there's a lot of people out there who are covering this very thoroughly. At the top of the list, uh, Eric McGracken, who's also a lawyer based in Canada. He does a tremendous job covering this and uh, john nash does a great job for bloody elbow and sometimes i see some people saying like oh mma media is not covering this and should be covering that or they're covering too much of this and that you have to understand every beat you know people focus on different things and so you know fight news that's important and cards and especially you know in this sport where there's no there's no time off there's no off season you get on this treadmill if you're job requires you to cover every UFC event or every Bellator event. Like it's hard to do this other stuff. So I'm, I'm very thankful for the likes of Eric and John who cover the other stuff, maybe the less glorious stuff. Um, and really focus on the regulation, the legal side of the game. And Eric does a great job of it last week. I'm going to read something here. Uh, this is from last Wednesday at almost exactly this time. August 9th, 2023, 425 p.m. Eastern. So almost exactly one week ago. Uh, this is from Reuters. Martial arts fighters wage lawsuit against UFC could proceed as a class action lawsuit. A U.S. judge in Nevada on Wednesday said a group of martial arts fighters suing the Ultimate Fighting Championship for alleged suppression of their wages can move forward as a class action seeking damages estimated at between $811 million and $1.6 billion. That's USD, by the way. Uh, U.S. District Judge Richard Bulware's decision grants class action status to more than 1,200 fighters who competed in live professional UFC promoted martial arts or mixed martial arts bouts in the U.S. between December of 2010 and June 2017. A couple fighters reached out to me and said, how can I join this? And if you have fought in that time period, you're just a part of it automatically. So there's nothing to like sign up or join. The plaintiffs contend Nevada-based Zufa which does business at the UFC, abused its market power to acquire or block rival promoters and used exclusive contracts to keep fighters within the UFC. The plaintiffs alleged the UFC suppressed fighters' bout compensation. Quote, the UFC pays its fighters only 20% of its event revenues when boxing and other major sports pay well above 50%, said Eric Kramer, chairman of Berger Montag who is a lead attorney representing the class UFC lawyer William Isaacson of Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Warden, and Garrison said Zufa planned to challenge the certification order in an appeal. The UFC has denied any antitrust violations. This is just one step in a long legal process. Isaacson said he also called the lawsuit legally and factually meritless. The UFC titled what it called a healthy competi uh, competitive MMA market, which benefits athletes, promoters, and fans alike. I mentioned Eric McGracken. He actually did a nice little two-minute video recapping the big news last Wednesday. Let's take a look at it. So breaking news, just today, a federal court in the U.S. has certified a class action lawsuit against the UFC. Now, this lawsuit's been going on for the better part of 10 years, and a few years ago, it looked like it was going to be certified. But today, the official reasons came out certifying the antitrust lawsuit. So in a nutshell, a bunch of fighters sued the UFC, saying they used illegal techniques to acquire dominance in the market and they abused that dominance in the market and the effect of that has been to underpay fighters drastically over the years. Uh, the lawsuit started by some individual fighters but they wanted it certified as a class action meaning hundreds and hundreds of fighters automatically get to participate in it. That's exactly what occurred today with the court's certification order. So there's a class of about 1,200 fighters that are now suing the UFC unless they opt out. And in a nutshell, 
These are reason, you know, really damning uh, reasons the court released today. They found on a preponderance of evidence that the UFC has used ruthless and coercive practices. And in a nutshell, there's three things the court said. Number one, that they use oppressive contracts. Number two, that they use ruthless tactics outside of those oppressive contracts. Uh, and combine those two things, keep fighters from really ever enjoying free agency. And three, the court found that the UFC has bought up competition, not to necessarily make their product better, but instead to give fighters fewer choices on the open market. So the courts found that the UFC has used a series of tactics over a number of years to lock themselves into a dominant market position and that they abuse that power to maintain that position. So this is interesting stuff, folks. This lawsuit is definitely worth keeping an eye on. I mean, that is just tremendous reporting, great journalism. Shout out to Eric and follow him on social media, on Twitter, on TikTok. Uh, so there you have it. There's the latest there. He can summarize it a hell of a lot better than me, but this is obviously not going to end anytime soon, but a massive step forward and a story that we should all be paying attention to. Uh, number two, Cole, good day, Ariel and crew. Thoughts on the two new MMA rules that got passed over the weekend. Bloody Elbow had the breakdown for the rules and proposed new rule. Uh, the approved rules, fighters will have access to a cut man after being cut by a foul or accidental headbutt. Love it. Fighters will have more time to recover from eye pokes before being examined by a doctor. Love it. Clarification around positioning fighters for a restart after a foul warning or physician's examination or a point deduction. Love that. And we also talked about that recently on the show as well. Proposed rule, clarification of how referees can reset fighters position after a foul. We talked about that as well. Uh, like all these, in fact, uh, let's give some more love to Eric McGracken. He did two videos about these proposed rules. He was at the ABC conference in Las Vegas just a few weeks ago. Take a look at this. Two brand new rules designed to help MMA fighters after they sustain a foul. These were just voted in at the Association of Boxing Commissions conference last week in Nevada. So here they are. Number one, when a foul occurs, whether it's a clash of heads, whether it's uh, an illegal strike of some kind, and you have a cut, Fighters now will have up to five minutes to recover from that cut. And during that time, a cut person could come into the ringer cage and they could tend to that wound. They can't tend to anything else, but they could tend to the wound. So it used to be the fighter had to resume the fight, make it to the end of the round, and only then the cut person could come in. But they've changed that to say, look, the cut person could address it immediately to give that fighter a better chance of being able to continue. Rule number two, this rule is designed to deal with how referees and doctors work together after an illegal eye poke. So when an eye poke occurs, timeout is called and the fighter has up to five minutes to recover. But here's the new nuances. Number one, uh, officials could give the fouled fighter a cold compress and they could put it on their eye to give them some time to recover. After a minute or 90 seconds, only then should the ringside physician come in. And if possible, the doctor shouldn't immediately shine a light in the fighter's eye and say, can you see? Because the answer is often no, you can't see right away. And then the fight is called. Instead, these rules are designed to say, look, give the fighter some time to recover, give them a tool to recover, let the doctor take a quick look at things, but not immediately ask about vision, let the fighter enjoy much of that five minutes, and then and only then ask if their vision is obstructed. And if it is, of course, the bout is over. But if it's not, they had a fair chance to recover. Here's the rules. Stalling fighters in mixed martial arts. There's a brand new rule that deals with how referees should address the situation. The unified rules of MMA have just been updated and referees have always had discretion to separate stalling fighters, but it's never been explained how or when they should exercise that discretion. This has now changed. The brand new amendment to the unified rules tells referees that if the competitors fail to demonstrate real, significant, sustained effort to try to move on and try to finish the fight, 
that's the situation where they could step in and deal with stalling fighters. So whether they're up pressed against the cage, whether they're on the ground, the referee could come in and separate them if they're not following this brand new rule. So here's a copy of it. I'd love to know your thoughts. All right. So again, uh, great breakdowns, kind of snackable videos, uh, very easy to follow and understand. And I like all those changes and the proposed one as well. Uh, the, the sport continues to evolve. It continues to improve. Uh, and as we've talked about, like I throw out things like open scoring and, you know, judging things like that. I, I know that the sport is only 30 years old. The only thing I want is progression, improvement, evolution. It's when the regulators and the commissioners sit and say like, oh, it's all good and we don't need to change anything. That's what pisses me off. But if they're trying to make things better and I would, you know, I would be surprised if anyone thinks that this is making things worse. Uh, that to me is promising and makes me feel like the people in charge, the regulators, the officials are not letting their egos get involved and they are trying to make things better. So this is all very promising to me. Uh, number three, Chase. Hi, Ariel. Is Sean O'Malley receiving the least deserved title shot in the UFC over the last five years? He won an extremely controversial decision against Piotr Jan. Sean has no other ranked wins in the UFC. All of Sean's other wins are fighters that have now been released from the UFC. I mean, I don't know. Uh, he's fought some tough guys and you can't just dismiss the Jan decision. It wasn't a robbery. It was a close fight. Um, you know, we, we've had fighters, especially in some of the lower weight classes, you know, like the Tyler Santos of the world, like she didn't have any huge, massive number one contender win. Uh, Yuri Prochaska only had a couple of fights in the UFC. So I, I, I don't think that that's necessarily fair. Um, you know, my, my guy, Jamal Hill didn't have a ton of fight. Like th there have been situations where, fighters have uh gotten opportunities and ran with it and no one's going to turn it down um it's you know it's it's up to the ufc it's up to their discretion to give that opportunity to someone for whatever reason it could be you know they need someone on the card they they have no one else in that particular way guys or the champion i mean sean strickland right uh like what, what's his big signature win he's getting a title shot on uh on on september 9th so i think the Jan one was pretty damn big and you know I don't love the fact that he had to sit for 11 months, but if that was the fight to get him the title shot back in October, like if he was getting one in February, I don't think anyone would have batted an eye. I think it's just the distance in between fights that leaves people, you know, asking questions like this. Um, Stefan, Shalom Ariel, Shalom. First question on the Substack: it pays to sleuth. Thank you. Anything goes, right? If I recall correctly, your deal with MMA fighting after turning heel Wani was for three years, correct? Which means we're almost exactly one year out, correct? In fact, I think the I think the the two year anniversary to the day was today, or yesterday, or tomorrow. It's like a one one of these days because I remember it was like second week of August, and then I went to SummerSlam in Vegas, and then I came back, and then I went to Jake Paul, Tyron Woodley one in Cleveland. So yeah, it's it's. Like we are celebrating essentially the two-year anniversary. How far out do those negotiations typically begin? Will you be testing the waters as you often advise fighters to do? Will you follow in line uh, with your favorite social media platform and become the X hour to become the show for everything? Wow, these are a lot of questions. I mean, uh, a year out is when you start to kind of think about the future, I would say. That's sort of like the signal to start thinking. Um, I would say typically in these things, especially in TV, rare for negotiations of any kind, but it does happen to happen a year out. Typically like eight, six months out is when it gets really fun. Um, I was telling someone recently, I mean, I couldn't be happier with the way things played out post ESPN, all the gigs, how they all fit in perfectly nice little you know, puzzle pieces that nothing intertwined, nothing overlapped. No one's feelings got hurt. No one was upset, at least to the best of my knowledge, they may say otherwise. And so I think the return has been great. You know, if we didn't come back, we don't meet GC. We don't meet mysterious Frank. We don't uh, reunite with corporate Alex and Joe. We don't get New York Rick back. I mean, it couldn't have worked out better. We had the show in Dallas uh, just a couple of weeks ago, which was incredible or the shows. So everything has been great. Um, but who knows? You know, they may not want me. They may say hit the road, Jack. 
they may say, you know, we're done. I don't know. You know, I've, I've been, uh, I've been surprised before. So let's see. Uh, I, I'm not one who loves change, believe it or not. Like I hate to move. I hate, I actually hate going on vacation. I dread it because of packing. Like I, I, I like routine as Tim and I were speaking about. I like knowing today I'm doing this today. I'm doing that. Even if the weeks are different. And I love the fact that my weeks are always, you know, different. Every day is different, right? Like Monday, I'm doing this Tuesday. I'm doing that. Nothing is the same, but I kind of like to know in advance. Um, so it's not like I'm seeking change, but you know, we'll see the, the media business is changing. It's evolving. He does bring up an interesting, you know, comment about the X hour, uh, that has been, you know, on my mind as well. I mean, I have a lot of interests just like DJ. So let's see, stay tuned, watch this space as they say. Um, but I think it's going to be all great things. And thus far, two years in couldn't be happier. Like there has been, thank God, no misstep, no regret, no frustration, really, really, really uh, appreciative about how everything turned out. Uh, Nick, gang, Chris Weidman making his comeback fight after that horrific leg break has been the sleeper news of the month so far. Couldn't agree more, Nick. Historically, no one has come back looking great after such an incident. Corey Hill, rest in peace. Anderson Silva both went on to lose most of their fights after healing back up. Tyrone Spung retired from kickboxing. is pretty much only boxed since it happened to him in 2014, aside from the Khairi Tanov loss in MMA. This is a massive deal and more people should be talking about it. Couldn't agree more. What's the gang's thoughts on this? P.S. Hope to hear Weidman's dad after the fight, Nick the Dane. I mean, I couldn't agree more. You all know he's one of my favorites. Covering him when he got into the UFC, even before he got into the UFC, the Sakara fight, the Maya fight, um, you know, the, the, the submission in Vancouver, getting the title shot, and then, you know, Hurricane Sandy, all, all that stuff that he's had to deal with, the ups and downs, when he broke his leg in Jacksonville, it was one of the most depressing things that I've ever seen covering MMA. I remember going to bed that night feeling legitimately sad because you get to know these people, you get to know their families, you get to know their wives, you get to know their kids, you get to know their parents. And like, you don't know what's going to happen with a leg break like that. What, what is the worst like amputation? Like uh, you, your mind just, it, it was horrific. It was absolutely horrific. And so to see him come back, I was telling this to someone yesterday. In life, when we go through something traumatic, we try to avoid any which way possible to repeat that traumatic event. Here's Chris Weidman. Here's Anderson. So these, these examples that were mentioned who suffered one of the most traumatic injuries that you could possibly suffer in athletics and did all that they could to just get back there, to do the exact same thing, to be in that spot, fights about to start, to go out there and, as he says, throws a leg kick off the bat. Let's see if he does. That's a different kind of human being. That's a different kind of breed. Um, and so I'm, I'm thrilled for him. I wish him the best. I love the fact that they put him up there against a fellow veteran and not a young gun who's going to try to like wipe the floor with him. Obviously the deck is, is stacked against them. Obviously, historically you don't come back looking the same, but he's a freak athlete. He always has been a very determined person and, and fighter. And, uh, you know, I, I, I just wish him the best. I absolutely do. And, and I think it might be flying into the radar. Like if this was, you know, a fight night or, or, you know, maybe a lesser card, uh, perhaps you would feel like we're talking about it more, should be talking about it more, but with Aljo and Sean and, and some of the big names, Ian Gary doing a good job of getting some attention, maybe it's flying into the radar, but not over here, my friends. I actually thought about asking him to come on. I feel like he's going through enough. I feel like there's probably enough, you know, attention and, and, and media and then, I wanted to let him be in, we'll reconvene in the future, but uh, wishing him the best. And I agree with you, Nick. It, it, it should be getting as much attention as anything on the card. Brantley. Hey, Ariel. Question in relation to Fyodor's interview last week. He mentioned he liked to box Mike Tyson and you started setting up a time slash location. Have you ever gone through behind the scenes and messaged a promoter to see if it was actually possible or do you just assume that they see it or hear about it from the show and you don't have to do anything. Curious if you've ever had a big hand in making a fight happen outside the show. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's a couple, probably the most famous one is, uh, Pat Cummins against Daniel Cormier. Daniel Cormier was supposed to fight Rashad Evans. I think it was UFC 270 or something like that. 
Rashad Evans pulled out like 10 days out. Um, man, what is his name? Uh, oh my God. I can't believe I'm blanking on, on the manager's name now. Your Crick is in there, right? What is his That's manager's correct. name? Um, I got to get this. I can't believe I'm blanking here. He was Mayhem's manager. He was, he was uh, King Mo's manager. He was Pat Cummings' manager. Someone out there, the wall man. Oh my God! How am I blanking on his name? <sighs> anyway, his it's going to come to me in a second. His manager, uh, Ryan Parsons. There it is. Ryan Parsons. Um, Ryan Parsons called me and said, like, we need to get Pat Cummins in. He's got a great story. He wrestled Daniel Cormier in college. He made him cry, all that stuff. I called Dana White and said, this guy's been trying to get into the UFC. He's got this great backstory. He made him cry, all that stuff. You need to talk to this guy. He could save the fight. Dana said, give me Ryan Parsons' number. Ryan Parsons got the call. He drove to Starbucks or whatever coffee shop that, that, that Pat Cummins was working at at the time, went through the drive through gave him the phone and, 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 and said, tell Dana the story. Dana wants to know the story. And he told Dana the story and he got the fight that day. And I think either later that day or the next day, they were both on Fox Sports Live talking about the fight. He was not in the UFC. And, you know, I'm just answering the question here. I thousand percent got him in. Also, uh, JDS was looking for a fight. Mark Hunt called me. This was, I think, 246 and said, how do I get the fight? And I, I called Dana and I said, Mark Hunt's looking for a fight and uh, wants this one. And he's like, does he really want it? Do we have to go through this guy? That guy's like, no. He says, deal with him directly. He wants the JDS fight. And he got the JDS fight. So yes, there have been times. And if I'm being honest, I feel like I should start writing these, downs, these down because I know there's been some others and I'm starting to you know get old and forget things. But those are probably the, the two biggest ones that I feel like I directly had a hand in uh in making and there's been other times here or there where you're asked to oh do you have this guy's phone number do you have that guy's phone number and i guess there's some person out there who would say like you shouldn't do that but like what do i care if, if it can help someone out um you know why the hell not makes for a good story we're all trying to get by so yeah there you go hello hello uh who do you think leaves ufc first in their current role Dana, Buffer, Rogan, or Anik? How would you rank them in order of biggest impact that would be felt by their absence? I mean, golly. Um, who do I think leaves first? I mean, I guess you would have to say Rogan just because like, he's the closest one to being out. Like, He went from doing every show to just doing the pay-per-views. Um, so I would probably say Rogan and then Dana. I mean, I don't see Buffer and Anik leaving anytime soon. Buffer may be the last one to leave. He just loves this so much. I mean, I could see Anna getting another job doing some other sport, um, but I think he loves it as well. Rogan just continues to get bigger and bigger, and then maybe at one point says, no mas, but I think he just loves this. I mean, I'm certain he doesn't do it for the money. I think he just enjoys... He's got a great gig. I mean, he just shows up for the 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 local, you know, non-international domestic pay-per-views. You get to do the biggest fights, the biggest cards once a month, in the United States, you're Gucci. So that's that's how I would rank them personally. But I don't see any of them leaving anytime soon because I think they love it immensely. Uh, P the G. Ariel, what in the world is going on with this whole first Cameroonian fighter in UFC history situation Saturday night? Are you pretending fighters who choose free agency don't exist anymore? Wild state of affairs. Love to hear your thoughts. I mean, look, I would like to chalk this up to a human error uh are they going to apologize for it i doubt it but you know there's there's actual human beings in those trucks that do these things and it's very possible that some graphics person screwed this up i would hate to think as you're looking at it right now this is from saturday's card i would hate to think that someone is trying to take a shot at not only francis Ngannou but the actual first cameroonian fighter in ufc history which was Ramotieri Sokuju, who had a great run in Pride and then uh, a run in the UFC as well. Francis Ngannou commented on this with the photo of him holding the Cameroonian flag. And obviously he himself showed love to Ramotieri Sokuju. There he is right over there. Uh, legendary mask that he used to come out to. Great moments in his career. 
most notably the little nog knockout. Uh, I would like to think that no one is asking the production staff and the, the lower thirds operator graphics operator to take shots at the likes of Francis and so could you, I can't imagine why there would be any beef with so could you feels like it's a, a, a Francis thing. So I'm actually going to say that this was human error. Now, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I really like, there, there's a part of me that feels like these things get blown out of proportion. And I can understand if I'm Francis or so could you, you'd be offended by that. But I, I, I'm not a conspiracy guy. And I like to think the best out of people in these situations. And I think sometimes people think that it's Dana White literally in the truck making these calls. Couldn't be further from the truth. Um, so let's, can we chalk this one up to a mistake? I mean, the timing is definitely a little bit strange. But why would they do this? Like, well, what's the point? What's the upside here? Well, like, you can't pretend like these guys don't exist, especially Francis, heavyweight champion. Feels like a, a mistake. GC, do you agree with me or do you think there's more to this? Are you a little bit more cynical than I am? Uh man, it's it, it's kind of weird like that it happens to be surrounding Francis Ngannou, but I I don't know, man. I mean, someone is typing that in. Like, someone had to have been like, uh, wasn't Francis Ngannou Cameroonian? Yeah, but I mean, you've you've worked in these situations, and yeah, I guess you just like, I guess you just mess up. But like, if that's gonna be your fighter fact, wouldn't you wouldn't you double check that? Yeah, no, you should. I've made issues. I, I've made I've made plenty of mistakes on graphics. This is a fairly big one, though, I suppose. This is a massive one, and the timing is very unfortunate. It's very odd. And the fighter it's surrounding is also very odd. I wonder, by the way, what the process is. Like, when you're putting up a fun fact like that, there has to be some sort of, like, fact-checking process. So what are they going through? Like, what is the person who's in charge of that? By the way, correct me if I'm wrong, doesn't your girlfriend have a similar job? Yes. Yeah, she works at ESPN. So- in, in but that capacity, like, do you have to go to because yeah, like, I know at ESPN there's like stats and info group, right? And so you send them. That's what I would see. I would see this. Like, you would send them. Is this correct? I don't know if the UFC has that. You know what I mean? So if like I, I would see people all the time sending that like Slack channel, the stats and info channel, being like, is it right that Russell Westbrook has the most? You know what I mean? So that you don't get these things wrong. I don't they're know. If, all, I don't know if it's just some guy in a truck doing this. There this. also had to have been more than one person's eyes on this. There's absolutely no way that just someone made it and then just fired it off, and that's that's all it was. I, I, like, I, feel, I don't know. You, <laughs> you, I don't know, man. You think so? I mean, dude, we by the time a lower third for us goes up, and theirs <laughs> is way more important than ours. I there know. has been yeah. like five sets of eyes that so, have looked. So at you're them. you're leaning you're leaning towards what you're leaning towards. This is a subtle shot. They're just trying to erase him from the history book. Yeah, but then at the same time, who would have who would have been like put that he's the only Cameroonian fighter in all time? Like who who would who would and go other out of their way than to say Dana that? White? Like, who who ultimately that? has a beef with Francis Ngannou there no. in the truck? Like why would they care? They're just people trying to do a job. I I think it was a. Every time I'm about to say that I think it was a mistake, I'm also like, man, how do you make this mistake? Like, how do you yeah. make this mistake? This is just such a ridiculously big mistake. And it got thousands, hundreds of thousands of eyes on it, I like know. after after Ngano tweeted about it. It is, it is, uh, yeah, the timing is unfortunate. It's dicey, it's Suspect? Dicey. Suspect? It's That's definitely insane. sus, bro. It's yeah. definitely it's sus. <laughs> It is tough. Uh, whoever the graphic guy is, whoever makes the oh third, it's God. definitely tough. I know he did not have a good afternoon on uh, on Saturday. No. Uh, Gary G, greetings, Ariel. My question is, do you have any insight on the Derek Lewis situation? Did the PFL get a chance to approach the Black Beast? I'm assuming the UFC threw a bag of money at him before PFL got a chance. I'm also wondering, okay, so let me just answer this. Uh, no, because there's always an exclusive negotiation period, so you can't get to the fighter. And as he said at the post-fight press conference in Utah, he wanted to stay and they gave him a deal that kept him happy. And so he's sticking around. I think it's an eight fight deal, which ensures he ain't going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, good for Derek. He seems very happy. Tried to get Derek on the show. He doesn't want to do a lot of media these days and, and more power to him. Love Derek. will always love Derek. Has been nothing but good to me. Um, happy for him. And yeah, he didn't want to leave. He didn't want to leave. Um, you know, I'm sure they're they're treating him well as they should because he's a big star and he got the Manscaped deal too. Shout out to him. That commercial was great, um, but no, no one else got to him because of that exclusive negotiation period. Um, I'm also wondering, Gary continues, if you've heard anything on Brian Ortega. It's been over a year now, and it doesn't seem like he's fight ready. I was there 
Live on Long Island for his last fight. I didn't anticipate this long of an injury hiatus. 10-7, Gary G. No update on Brian Ortega. Um, see him out there. Seems like he's training. Seems like he's healthy. Doesn't seem like he's still battling the injury, but is he fight ready? You know, is he training camp ready? TBD. So yeah, crazy that that was over a year ago and uh, not much since. Still one of the most popular fighters in that division, but yeah, not much since. And uh, I don't have anything concrete to share. Max83, Guten Tag, Ariel. Yes, Guten Tag. And uh, congratulations to all the German fans out there who uh, are happy about Harry Kane joining Bayern Munich. I just saw his first interview with Sky Sports this morning. Didn't offer much. Still quite weird to see him in that jersey, but uh, anyway, that's the business of sports. Any update, by the way, on the UEFA Super Cup, GC? I, I understand Man City is playing Sevilla this evening uh, over there. Any updates on that? Yeah, actually, at the half, Sevilla leads 1-0. Wow. Yeah. Tough sledding these days for Man City. Of course, KDB out. Uh, I don't know if you yeah. saw that. Yeah. Big injury. Um. Wow, that is that is surprising. Yeah, my I mean, my, my son's probably in tatters right now. They got to focus on uh, Newcastle on Saturday. That's right. Oh uh, my, gosh. my girlfriend is actually watching. She weighed in on the Ngannou thing. Oh wow! She says Expert there was un- analysis. Okay, she go says ahead. there was undoubtedly multiple eyes on it, but she doesn't believe that it uh, was malicious. She thinks it would just be highly unprofessional if there was malicious intent behind it. <laughs> See, that's what I think as well. But that is crazy. Multiple eyes missed that. Like when you have. A sta- and thank you to her for that. I appreciate it. If you have a stat like that first, that's a very like Googleable thing to look. Is that the word? Uh, Goog- like Googleable thing? Googleable, right? Googleable. How is no one uh, checking that? Also, like if we can go back to the picture right quick of it, it's also like it's the highlighted thing too. Like it's like it <laughs> sticks out with the white font. Uh, oh yeah, I mean it. Okay. Is it possible, by the way? Okay, now that I look at this again. Is it possible that they meant to say only Cameroonian fighter in the UFC and someone fucked it up and turned it into UFC history? history? Absolutely, yeah. On the UFC roster. Like uh, it also it also that's what I feel like. It also is weird to say it like instead of being like first Cameroonian fighter in UFC history, only Cameroonian fighter in UFC history sounds just sounds very weird. That actually makes it sound malicious. Only Cameroonian fighter on the UFC roster sounds like what they meant to put and there was a uh yes a complication in communication <laughs> i feel so for that person bad. by the way like the moment oh, where yeah. you see your work because like you're you're a graphics person like that you don't want to go viral you don't want to fuck up and all eyes will be on you in that truck because i think it got out right like it got out mid-event oh yeah no doubt no doubt right no, 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 no no people notice it instantaneously like it was immediate yeah. people notice it and I know whoever was the final person, whoever typed that in, their stomach, their dropped. heart probably like, went they, all the way to their ankles. Yes, <laughs> yes. their the their ass fell bit. out for sure. What is it? Oh, Frank? someone wants to break well, the fourth wall. Who's that? When we were in Dallas, there was a graphics op, and Mike Heck got on the stage with you, and the guy taps me on the shoulder. He's like, "Who is that?" And I was like, "Oh, he's an employee of ours." And then he taps me again, and there's a lower third on his screen. It says Mike Heck a MMA hour employee. And I'm like, no, 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 no. That's not his title. <laughs> but just uh, to think that this is the same thing. Like, who is that guy? Oh, he's a Cameroonian fighter. Like, oh, let me type out that he's the first one in UFC history. Oh, man, but they are not doing these on the fly. These have been finalized days in advance, I, I can be sure of. I mean... Oh, that for sure. The the, <laughs> the freak out that that person... It, like, gives me nightmares, the freak out that that person must have had. I feel anxiety just thinking about the scenario where that person realizes that they just really oh, yeah. fucked up. Especially, it's not just saying, like, oh, only Iranian fighter. Like, there's no... T- it's tied to, like, one of the biggest stories of the last year in the UFC. It just so happened to be yeah. that Francis is from Cameroon, and you know that this is going to be made out to be a massive deal. Like, if you would have said, like, only Danish fighter in UFC history, definitely insulting to Mark Madsen and Martin Kampman and all these guys, but there's no controversy attached to Danish fighters right now. It happened to be Cameroon that you messed up on? Golly. My girlfriend chimes good. in one more time. Oh, yes, please. She said, if I was on the crew that it happened to, I can guarantee you there would be a big talking to afterward from the higher producers. Do you think dismissal? Do you think I don't think think dismissal, but I think I think someone got a serious, serious talking to. My my biggest mistake I've ever made in production, 
Uh, we were doing a live broadcast for a Yankees game. I feel like I've told this before, but we got Aaron Judge, and we got oh. like ha- we got like halfway through the interview. Aaron Judge, obviously a big name, doesn't have a lot of time. Uh, we got Aaron Judge on the broadcast, uh, and it was a taped interview. We got halfway through it, and I realized I, I was not recording. And ah. my stomach. I was like, I had the biggest internal freak out. Had to tell everyone. <laughs> they had to tell Aaron. They were like, oh, yeah, Aaron, our board op didn't start the recording, so uh, we're just going to have to re-rack this. And he's like, uh, all right. Uh, I guess that, like you could just tell he was annoyed. It was like, oh, man, my, who my was the face reporter? was definitely red. Or who was the host? I'm trying to remember who. Because uh, that person is probably more annoyed than Aaron Judge. Like Aaron Judge is like, whatever, I'm just going to give you candy. Oh, the, produ- now. the producers and the and the host. Yeah, they talked to yeah. me pretty seriously afterward. Uh, and it was like fire- the biggest, like, I was so guilty. Like, I was like, so like, oh, God, I'm so sorry. Yeah. So I'm sure whoever did this felt terrible. But what, you, you didn't get fired. Look at this. My face is getting red right now. Just I know, I know. That's how embarrassed I was. Uh, no, I did not get fired. No. All right. That's pretty. Now, by the way, did you consider just recording midway interview and yeah, then just saying, like, I don't know what happened. Yeah, I pressed yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I considered a lot of things. And then I was just like, okay. this is Aaron Judge. Like, I, I have to come clean on what happened. If it was like, yeah, did you, if it was, you know, Ariel Hawani MMA, you know, ESPN MMA journalist, I would have been like, sure, hey, you know, sure, we missed, sure. We missed the starting of the recording. But yeah, NBD. It was, it was nightmare scenario. Now, now, did you alert them mid interview or did you wait for the interview to end? Not mid interview because I was like, we have to stop. We have to we have to Fuck. shut it down and restart it. Uh, <laughs> it was so bad. Uh, it was by the way, so even bad. hearing someone in your position saying we have to stop makes me feel sick to my stomach. That's the worst. You're in an interview and like, oh yeah, uh, we didn't catch that or uh, what? I have to fake this now. I was I doing know. a real sports story yesterday, uh, which I'll be very excited to share with all of you in the very near future. And there was one point where we had like a great answer, and then they said they didn't catch it because a freaking uh. plane was over the. Uh, <laughs> spot that we were standing I, like, oh, uh, I have to ask it's just like you can't recreate that no one near can't. as bad as as your blunder though but oh so bad still, so bad yeah. all right well thanks for that great insight uh from the truck we could have a whole new segment tales from the truck uh it is very i had to sit in the truck a couple times and uh i don't i don't i don't envy people who have to sit in trucks i mean it's a tough job there's a lot of stress you got people screaming yelling f-bombs all over the place there's no daylight you're like you're, usually trucks, for those that haven't been there, they're very tight. There's not a lot of space. You're in there for hours, and you walk outside, and like the sun hits you, and you're like, ah, the outdoors. It's a tough gig. It's not fun. Everyone thinks it's glamorous that you get to go to all these events, but then you make a mistake like that, and everyone hates you. It's no fun. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, back to Max from Germany, I do believe. Yes. Uh, I know you and Connor share a strong history together, but I am slash was a big fan of his back in the day. Nowadays, I'm basically just concerned about him as a human being. All of his appearances are just weird to me. Do you really believe that he's coming back in December, as he said? I think the ship has sailed, and we maybe don't see him ever again. P.S. We need Don Fry. Greetings from Germany, my man. Uh, and uh, moderator Lewis, who, as always, does a great job, tells me that uh, this particular individual continues to ask for Don Fry. We'll get him. I mean, I don't think it's too hard to get Don. Legend. The Predator. Um, I think Connor fights again. Do I think December is possibly not going to happen? Absolutely. But I do think he fights again. It's a weird thing going on now with Connor and Michael Chandler because the ultimate fighter just wrapped up and like you could see Chandler's trying to bait him into a fight and to get his, his interest peaked with the small hands with the, he's not going to do this and that. And I, I don't know if it's working necessarily on Connor, but as I said last week, I think the fight to make is Connor versus Chandler. If only because Chandler was promised the fight and I know the fight game is full of empty promises, but it would be kind of shitty if he went in and, and fought someone else. He could definitely do that. Justin Gaethje, Nathan Diaz. But yeah, I, I, uh, I, I believe GC was the one that sent us the clip of the, the time that I was at the Black Forge Inn in May for the Katie Taylor fight when he was holding court back there. And he said at the end of the Ultimate Fighter, they would have the date for the fans of when he uh, would fight Michael Chandler. And yesterday was the last episode of the Ultimate Fighter. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, GC, they did not have a date, right? Nope. No, no, no. We had, how, we did had they, f- how did they address it? Uh, Conor McGregor 
and Michael Chandler will meet in the octagon at some point down the road. Uh, something, right. something like that. Like uh, a much anticipated contest in the octagon awaits. Uh, it sounded like for a, v- a very brief moment at the end, uh, as they were finishing things up, they like talked about 292 and like how the finales are going to be on it. And then they talked about Chandler and McGregor. And like it sounded like they might be like, they're going to fight. And then they dropped the like, at some point. Didn't yeah, it's a weird date. one. I think December might be... I mean, they don't really need a big fight for December. They certainly don't need one for November. And there's a chance that Leon and Colby fight on that card. And then you may have Yuri and, and Alex in December. And so, like, what I would do is just kind of save them for 298 or 299 and just have two massive shows back-to-back. Uh, but, yeah, it's it's definitely a weird one. Um I don't know. I don't know what's. I, I don't. I don't. I don't know. Like how many times he's gonna fight, but I, I feel confident saying he's gonna fight again. That's 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 how I feel at the moment. Do you feel otherwise? Nah, I, I'm with you on that. Some point, early next year. Why does he do those videos where he's wearing the like the speedos <laughs> and then? <laughs> yeah, we got another one this morning. Yeah, I, saw I don't know if we ever talked about it. On, I mean, there's a. Uh, Anytime there's a McGregor pose, you know you're in for it when you get the when you get the blue box and it's just the audio. The blue, like, he's the, blue, the only one that still uses the audio function. I, I don't think I've ever seen anyone else do it. You know you're in no. for a good time when you see the blue audio box. <laughs> the yacht videos are, I mean, the one last week of him yelling at the Fertitta's yeah. yachts, I've probably yeah. watched like 150 times. Uh, just, just get some work crazy. in, lads. Be over shortly. <laughs> It's <laughs> best part. It's so good. Oh my gosh! Uh, overall, what what score would you give out of ten? To your first tough. season of The Ultimate Fighter. Uh, we're we're grading this on like comparing it to other reality shows. Just, I think your your I think your expectations were high. I think you were excited about it. Expectations were Can way man- too high. Way yeah. my expectations were here. They should have been much closer to here. Entertainment value. You know how captivating it was. How interested you were in it. I I was interested in it, and it kept my interest throughout. But I was also, you know, I I got to get on the show Tough Hang afterward and like talk about it uh, with AK Lee and, and Casey Lydon. So like I think that helped. Like if I if I was not doing that show. I don't know if I would have made it through the entire season, like watching every episode every week. I feel like I would have just been checking in more. I mean, the inter- the entertainment value, like when it comes to like an, an actual reality show itself, it was not good. Like if I'm if I'm stacking this up against like a Survivor, or like any of like the big name reality shows, like it's the challenge. I know Rick is here. I know he loves the challenge. Uh, like, I mean, I'm giving it like a D plus, a C minus. It's, wow. it's so formulaic. It's just like there's nothing really this, that draws you in. There's no drama. There's no anything. I love the fact that you're calling it formulaic and you're right in doing so. And and you didn't watch the previous 29 or whatever seasons. <laughs> 30, it's, the previous been the exact same. Yeah, yes, it's been the exact same thing. We don't get it's any insane. drama until the very last episode. Then we find out Cody it, Gibson and Brad Katona hate each other. And I'm like, where was wow. any of this the entire season? Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll say it. one one asterisk to the it's the same every time they did try that live season, which I thought, you know, good yeah. effort at least to try and like switch it up. I don't know if, you know, ultimately that was super successful. It, it created much. some good talent. Um, but yeah, whatever we I get mean, contender series. That's pretty pretty live. And also <laughs> it was almost it was almost inhumane. They made them stay in the house for 13 yes. freaking weeks. It was absurd. Yeah. yeah, I if I'm not mistaken, I believe it was Aaron McKenzie who was on Team McGregor. He's been tweeting. Uh, a decent amount about like how yeah I believe it was Aaron McKenzie about how negative of an experience the entire thing was. Oh, for it's him. brutal! Like Six he, weeks he, can't talk to your family. Yeah, he lost and he lost pretty early on and like having to hang out for however many weeks and like I, I don't really know how you fill the time from that point. Um, so yeah, I mean, I also I feel like, like if you lose, you got to leave. That's that's there, how it. There's been be. times though where those people step in. If there's injuries, True. so I, I no, think there's a back. there's a reason to be around put, and put stay them in another house. Ready. Put them in another house where they have access to phones and stuff like that. And if you need them, they have to come back. Could in, do. you know? Yeah, 
Yeah, and like, but the, then if they come back, people are going to be like, "Oh, they got to do that," and there's going to be whining and griping about the, that. The vets, eh, the vets versus prospects thing was like ended up being like pretty dumb, especially because like some of the prospects were like 36. It, it should have just been was in the UFC, like UFC veteran versus the potential of prospect, and it was also kind of a mismatch. Like we got no prospects in the in the finales on Saturday. We only really got one that even won Enrico De Shula. Um so like it was, it was kind of one way traffic for Team Chandler the whole way. Like we didn't even get. Here, to Here's see, the like, bottom line: the uh, ultimate. Sorry for interrupting, but the no, ultimate no, like, the ultimate like hook that this show had was that, you know. We got exposed to some great young fighters, some future superstars, some future title contenders, some future champions. Those don't exist anymore. If anything, they're just getting signed outright or they're going on contender series. You know what I mean? Like yesterday, I know he didn't win, but like George Hardwick, there was a lot of excitement about him fighting. And so he's going on contender series. He's the Cage Warriors champion. He's not going on the Ultimate Fighter. And so like if you don't have that anymore, what do you have? You know what I mean? What do you have? You don't have much. By the you way, got weeks of programming to... for ESPN Plus, which is all the only thing I know, thing but they and how did it do? How did it do? Yeah, I can't, I can't That's imagine. That's a great question. Great and they, they did as as big as big gets uh, with with McGregor, bringing McGregor in to go against uh, Chandler. Uh, one question that is posed, uh, Brad Katona in the finale on Saturday, uh, trying to become a two-time Ultimate Fighter champion. Is he the ultimate, ultimate fighter, or is he the ultimate fighter? That's been a big topic of debate. Oh, wow. Ultimate fighter is nice. strong. Oh, Much hello. Has been look at Matcha at the, in the building. She's just chilling at the front door, crying. Uh, she won't time. look at the camera? Like, hey, come the on. The whole wait. family There left. she goes. She must have heard there me. There she is. Machi, why are you crying? No one's here in the house, and she's crying at the door. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> she's sweating, actually. I think she's nervous that everyone left her. Machi, yeah. what's your problem? Why are you being so shy all of a sudden? Oh, look at that. We've come a long way. <laughs> We've come a long way. Machi, why? What's the problem, Machi? Why are you crying? You have to talk in that voice, you know? Oh, of course. Anyway, yeah, yeah. You got to have the dog done, voice. Right? The dog voice is great. Machi, what's your problem? Why are you being so coy? Are you a You're dog hater, crazy? Rick? I'm not a dog hater, but like I could sit out the, that moment. Like let, let you have that. You know what oh. I mean? <laughs> What's better than this? The, vo the like, voice and, and you don't the whole like the thing. voice, bro. I, I could, you don't like the dog talk. I could sit that out if I'm being honest. I get honest. home, my God. my tiny pint sized dog runs up to me. I give him, you know, what's up, big man? You gotta you gotta give the dog the voice, man. Come on, you I'm ever with, think you'd see I'm this? Ray. You never thought you'd see this? No, me. no, definitely not. Especially because oh. I know the story of how oh, how, how much it came to you and the feelings initially. So yeah, no, I do not. I did not see this coming, but I am happy. I mean. It, Clearly, this this is part of the family. So yeah, very oh, happy my for God. you. Where she sees the the the, the luggage, <laughs> she's getting all worried about it. Oh, my poor Machi. Oh, why? <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you hate the dog voice, Rick. I mean, that just comes with having a dog. It's just part, you know. It's it's part of the whole fun. By the way, you come yes. home. No that, one wants to talk to me anymore, except for I'm, for for Machi. She's the only one. No, I'm all for you me. having that. I don't need to be party to you having that. You can have that, you know? Like, that's that's for you guys. Machi's trying to tell me something right now. Let me just kick her out. Sorry, guys. Machi, you got to go out. I'm All right, so you decided uh, I like on... I like Multimate. I like Multimate, Multimate for what it's worth. I think that's pretty clever. I think I'm an Ultimate Ultimate fighter. Guy. Oh, Chris Weidman, there he is. Uh, Shout out to Chris. <laughs> yeah, we just... And to, and to John Galang. Uh, yes. They left Shout me alone. Shout out to John Galang. Beast. Um, all right, let's get to the uh, oh, like, wait, just... hey, before before we get to the last question, we we were oh, no. just posing a question. Brad Katona trying to become the first uh, two time Ultimate Fighter champion, and the question is posed: Ultimate Fighter or the Ultimate Ultimate Fighter? I think you gotta go Ultimate Ultimate. Oh wow! W you're the, why you're would the you deciding vote, Connor? What, which is it? Yeah. I, I've been backing Ultimate Ultimate Fighter the the whole season, so I'll stick with it because I'm not right, gonna I guess lie. I'm not voted. When he said it on the show, he was like, "Is it he?" Brad Katona asked the question. He said, "Ultimate Fighter," and like for the first three or four seconds, I was like, "What does he mean by that?" Maybe I'm just slow, but uh, but yeah, I didn't. Ultimate Ultimate, compl you know, immediately clicked. I like that champ. Yeah, it's like ultimate, double ultimate. champ versus champ champ. You get the you right. get the there you go. different flavors. He's on flavors. Team McGregor too, so he will be a double champ. Are they going to bring both the trophies out for him if he wins on Saturday? Big no, it's like Boston. a glass. 
It's usually like some yeah. kind of like weird glass configuration thing. I know, that's I what I'm saying. Like, is he going to be holding both the glass configurations <laughs> up against his shoulder? <laughs> I hope not. The ultimate, ultimate champ. Uh, they, they forgot the, to bring out the second belt for Connor when he won at MSG. They're definitely not the bringing ultimate, out the ultimate second ultimate fighter glass. doesn't apologize to anyone. Yeah. All right. That's enough tough talk. Um, no soup for you. Hello, lads. No Soup is back with a juicy question. Enough of these softballs for Ariel. Ariel, what's going on with Frankie Edgar? Did he really not talk to you because of Ali? And is that why he's barely been mentioned by you since? Something must have happened behind the scenes. You love to have the legends like Pulver on, which is great, but not a peep about Frankie since he retired. I don't think that's fair or accurate. I did talk a lot about Frankie uh, going into that last fight, spoke about it after. I mean, he hasn't really done anything to talk about on this show since. But yes, to answer your question, he did stop coming on because of Ali. Uh, I knew Frankie before he knew Ali, and I'm not, I don't want, the last thing I want is to get into any type of feud with Frankie Edgar. I was a little bit bummed that that happened. Um, but, you know, Ali makes some money, and he's he's got a side with this guy. I get it. Who the hell am I? We had great interviews. Uh, I feel like I covered him really fairly and, and in a fun way, the pizza thing with Mark Henry. Uh, still maintain a great relationship with Mark Henry. And even with Frankie, I texted him before the fight, after the fight. Uh, no hard feelings. You know, it's all very stupid and unfortunate, all this stuff. And uh, I wish, you know, I wish it didn't happen four years plus now. I don't even understand why it's a thing. Uh, I don't even think he understands why it's a thing. Ali, that is. Um, but yeah, I mean, what would you want me to say about him? in the last eight, nine, 10 months. We, we definitely talked about him going into the MSG fight and after the MSG fight, what more is there to say? I would have loved to have him on before or after. I'd love to have him on tomorrow, but uh, can't do it. So what, what do you want me to do? I don't know what, what else there is to say. Not my call. I saw him once in a uh, airport in the midst of all this and it was, it was totally fine. If I saw him today, it'd be totally fine too. He he's 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 showing loyalty to his guy. He's following his guy's, um, you know, advice if you want to call it that, request. And you know, I I can't I can't fault that. You know, I wish I wish the guy would drop it, but uh, I don't think he is anytime soon. And I don't think we have been as affected as he suspected we would be. Uh, Aaron. Hey, Ariel, as an interviewer, we often face the challenge of needing to ask questions that push or challenge our guests. For example, it's clear that asking fighters that uh, about pay can be a tough topic to discuss, but is relevant to the business of MMA. You've demonstrated a remarkable skill, thank you, in acknowledging the difficulty of certain questions while maintaining a respectful approach. Can you share your perspective on crafting engaging questions and how to be both a strong and considerate interviewer. I truly appreciate your time, insights, and all the energy you give to the sport. Shout out to Aaron Pete. He, he's very positive and very kind on social media. We, we tend to talk about the negativity and, and the haters and stuff like that, but I see his comments and his tweets, and uh, I appreciate them very much. So much love and, and, and shout out to him as well. You used an interesting word there, crafting engaging questions. Um, as I've said before, I don't write my questions in advance, even if it's, you know, if it's for this show, if it's for a two hour real sports interview, if it's about something I'm completely, you know, foreign to, if it's for the basketball interviews, wrestling, those sit downs, the BT ones, TNT. Now I, I just don't like writing them. Do I want to ask certain things? Do I want to, you know, inquire about certain things? Yes. Um, and the best way to navigate those waters, in my opinion, are to just ask those hard questions in a respectful way. I know that's very easy to say, but like in a soft, respectful, approachable, comforting way. Uh, if you just start out saying like, hey, why did you do this? Or hey, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, I hate the talk about question. That's the worst. Talk about this. Your thoughts on this? Um, you know, have I made these mistakes in the thousands of hours that we've done? Most likely, but the best is when you can just, you know, that's why I've always tried to speak in a kind of like soft, calm way. You want this to feel relaxed. You want this to feel, you know, um, down to earth. It's just two friends chatting and, and you ultimately don't want it to feel like an interview. And that's what I hope, you know, like oh, the greatest compliment that I would always hear people say about Howard Stern is like, they get in that chair, they're sitting there and they forget they're doing a show. And so I, I always hope that that is the feeling. Um, 
you always try to make that you know the uh the, the like the 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 end game and have them say like wow i can't believe we spoke about that because i wasn't really thinking about interview consequence this and that just like we're just we're just talking um and that's not me trying to trick them or be sly or anything like that i'm just you know i'm just trying to ask uh questions and get answers to things that people want to know about these people uh the good sometimes the bad sometimes the ugly i'm not shooting for any of that um that's the thing that i never understood about the instigating thing it's like oh well, of course like if you're just going to ask positive 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 fluffy questions all the time there'll be no sort of you know drama or anything like that but like that's part of the job the job is to ask about certain things but to do it in the most respectful and appropriate way possible and i've tried to do that throughout my career Sometimes you succeed, sometimes you fail. Sometimes people think that you're asking things with bad intentions. Sometimes people don't really understand why you're asking things. Sometimes people misconstrue questions. Uh, this is all going to happen. It has happened. It will happen. It will probably happen down the line as well. Um, and that's just part of the gig. And you hope that you have enough you know, credibility and history and connections and, and, and body of work to suggest that like you're not trying i couldn't care again as i've said a thousand times i couldn't care less if if a video gets x amount of views versus it. i i don't i don't profit off of any of that so like i have no real i'm not pushing for any of that i'm trying like the dj conversation is the exact thing that i would point to i didn't think that we would talk about the stuff on the back end it just kind of flowed i had nothing written i had no real direction and and we went an hour and i was like holy shit i've kept him for too long petrosky as well like i knew a little bit about his story but that that to me is the best part of the job um and the best part of interviewing period like when you just like i said i i've been working on this real sports story and i'm so enamored with the subject because i keep learning more about this individual and i'm just blown away by the way he lives his life and the way he thinks about things. And I'm like, why? Well, I just, I, just can't, I can't get enough. I just want to keep asking more and more questions. I could sit there for three hours. What about this? And how do you deal with that? Because I want to get better too as a human being, but I want people to learn um, about these people. And, and that's what I feel like the job of the interviewer is. So again, people may have uh, different interpretations of what you know your intentions are. I could tell you from the heart here, you know, I don't, I don't have any sort of agenda. I don't have any sort of malicious intent. I'm just trying to talk to interesting people and get, you know, get their story out there, the good, the bad, the ugly, and have you judge whether or not you like them. Uh, you know, I, I can have my feelings internally, but ultimately it's not really my call here. Um, and that's why I'll have people from all walks of life on the show and, and, and try not to even shy away and try to steer towards people that I know have different you know, um, different ways of life and line of thinking than I have, because I think those are the most interesting people to talk to. Uh, if you're just surrounding yourself with the same like-minded people, it's not that fun. It's not that interesting. You don't learn anything. There's nothing to really pry about. You're just talking to yourself. There's nothing to really ask. There's nothing to really investigate. There's nothing to really follow up on. Uh, it's the different people, the new people, the the unique ones that are the most fun and, and challenging to, to speak to. And I enjoy those challenges very much. So I don't know. Uh, I guess that, that would be my answer, but, uh, but I would ultimately say like, I sometimes watch these interviews and they're so stiff and formal and, and, and that doesn't make the subject comfortable. So ultimately what I think you need to remember is like being relaxed, being comfortable, being conversational will get people to feel that same way and ultimately open up. All right, great stuff. Great questions, appreciate all of them. Appreciate moderator Lewis as well for uh, compiling them. Uh, that's it for me guys, um, but back on Monday, of course, post pay-per-view Monday, couldn't miss it. As we've been teasing, we've got the boys leading the way we've got new york rick and gc it's the uh it's 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 i don't know what it's called it's the gc and rick show it's the rick and gc show it's the new york and georgia show. i don't know i don't know what's happening do we have any more details that we can share or we're still keeping it we're keeping I, I it i think we've got to uh, keep it under wraps all right, all right yeah all right. we gotta keep it under wraps 
It's just you got to be there. Surprise. Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern. Exactly. Yeah, we got to keep it under wraps. So, like, we, if we give it away, then no one will show up. So we That's have to point. we have to leave some something for surprise so they'll at least show up. Maybe some special so, guests. Maybe not. I can't Who wait. knows? I can't wait to tune in. Who knows? Yeah. Maybe I don't know. If you if you can carve out some time for me, maybe I pop in. You know. Maybe uh, yeah. Yeah. Maybe we'll see. Yeah. I mean, send me the Zoom link. You know. <laughs> maybe I'll hit me up with your your booking producer. Um, We'll find out in the studio, out of the studio, you know, in the control room, out of the control room, at home, you know, like, but I don't From know home. what's going to happen. From I home. Like that idea. Does I that, like that idea. I have to ask you here, here, now it's your moment. Does, how weird does that feel? You have no control over this. We, we could go on air the MMA hour with Ariel Hawani graphics roll out and we could do anything. How do you feel about this? First of all, I would say, I don't know if there's anything on this planet right now that gets me more excited than that notion right there. I don't have to book a show on Monday. I mean, are you kidding me? This is a gift from the heavens. Number one, uh, as you know, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't pass the baton very easily. Uh, you will now have the distinction of doing it twice GC first time. I don't think there's any two people that I would trust with that show. I would either just decide not to do the show. We shut it down for the day or whatever. Uh, but I feel like we're in very capable hands and it's actually exciting to be excited for my show as a fan. You're a fan like, I'm looking of your own shovel for this week and hearing the insights, downloading it, watching it, all that stuff and more uh, as a fan, just tuning in myself. I think it's going to well, be Well, we're fantastic. excited to have you as a fan. Um, it's going to be a great show. I hope you guys get what? 35,000 live concurrence smash our francis that feels Ngani low show, which i think is the uh yeah no why not Fuck when it. they when they know when they know what guests we're gonna have you'll, you're Maybe gonna get aljo 50. and sugar sean in studio together 48 hours removed from Book the rematch title, live but... on the show <laughs> i'm already i'm already getting the bradley martin response to dj we're gonna oh we're gonna break. my god <laughs> we're gonna push yourself. the desk out of the way we're it. gonna have bradley and dj roll DJ was like, I don't want to complicate <laughs> oh, things. All right, we won't complicate things. Let's do it right We've here. got Never Zuck and Musk wow. in talks. Not right. yet. Live not confirmed yet. Live in talks. talks. In the in works? Talks. Efforting? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, had to, Mark I had to remake Green. a Facebook. Mark, um, you know, the bubble. He, he, the bubbles are popping up with Mark. So it's not 100% okay. yet. Oh, we'll, yeah, yeah, once, yeah, yeah. once we clear the bubbles, then we'll, we'll see what happens. By the way, your level of interest in DJ versus Bradley Martin, you're correct? I mean, based on how DJ's laid it out, like he just wants to like prove something. It's not going to like, it, I'm not expecting like this to be Bradley Martin is actually trying to rip his head off and DJ's trying to like take his arm home or his neck. Um, so not as much. It feels like it's a little too cordial. You know what 12. I mean? I, I need some animus in my fight. I need to, I, I need there to be a reason that they're fighting rather than just like, Hey, I want to show that little guys can fight. Like I know DJ can fight. I don't need to. I don't need to see that. I know he would twist Bradley Martin into a pretzel. Don't 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 need it to be seen. Twelve out of ten. I I want to see the visual. You're of, into a twelve out of ten. Of someone of someone a foot taller and a hundred pounds heavier, as Rick put it, getting twisted you, like a pretzel. You you can watch some like ADCC like open weight stuff, yeah. and you'll see it. You'll see like I, I want to see and DJ and Bradley Martin do it though. Wow. Why, why? Could you imagine the about... visual? He was like, yeah, I could pick him up and drop, like, like put him down, take him down. Could you imagine DJ just body slamming Bradley Martin? That would be insane. I can. Why are we hearing so much about Bradley Martin all of a sudden? Is it just because of this gimmick where he's challenging all these fighters? I mean, he has a ton of followers. Like, he's... He does? He's, yeah. He's, Is this uh, show good? He, Is this show good? Do you he's like a it? big-time influencer. Yeah, oh, I, I know him more from, like, content. Ton. Yeah, he's a big, yeah, like, I know him more from content than content, the show. Like, gym content. Uh, but I mean, like he had yeah. Nate Diaz on in the in the build up to the to the Jake Paul Nate Diaz fight. Like, yeah, I don't think he's just coming out of nowhere. I think he just has this channel with a bunch of followers, and like he keeps posing this question, and like it gets clipped off. People, love I think it. he's smartly done something that like the Nelk Boys did, which is like you attach yourself to fighting, and there's a new audience that comes with that, and now he's leaning into that. I think he went on O'Malley's podcast, O'Malley and Tim's, and like they actually had like a really civil discussion about like a street fight, not just like grappling. Oh yeah. And O'Malley was like, he was like, I don't really want to find out because you're gigantic, but like I think I have the skills to handle you. Uh, Do you think he's clean? 
I, I mean, we have the picture right here. Like, I mean, Basically everyone else. Clean. I mean, he's. I don't he's, know enough about that world, but he's spending some he's hours in the jacked. gyms if he's clean. Like he Jesus. is jacked, dude. How is that possible? How do you even get that? A lot bit? of time in the gym. A lot of time in the gym. Respect. A lot of protein, amino acids. Horse meat. Yes. That was the that was the key. Right. Right. Um, all right. Well, uh, man, great stuff from DJ. DJ was awesome, wasn't he? Great. He's just couldn't get enough. He's come of such man. a. He's Can't come such a that. long way in the interview game. Like when we first met him, where he just didn't want to ever open up and give you anything. Now he's just like, it just feels like, what the fuck you want to talk about? Let's go, let's go talk, talk. I was like, <laughs> yeah, see, I can't yeah. even, I can't even imagine he's, like him not opening up. Like you're just like, oh, you yeah. got sick and left. He's like, fuck yeah, I was having diarrhea. Just... <laughs> I'm like, all right, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, his fate was so. His fate was so tied to the UFC brand and product and he didn't want to misstep. And then at a certain point it wasn't. And he was like, well, I'm just going to be DJ. And we love that DJ. I think we like that DJ a lot more. Once he started swearing, it all changed. Remember there was a point yeah. where even him swearing was weird. And Squeaky then he was clean. Like, Fuck it. Yeah. Yeah. Tremendous. Uh, all right, gents. Much love. Good luck on Monday. Perhaps we'll talk then. Enjoy uh, vacation. As far bro. as... Yeah, thank you. As far as me hosting this show... Uh, the next time you'll see me doing so will be September 6th. So we'll have the Monday show, and then we'll be off for two weeks. And so uh, we hope you don't miss us too much. But again, there is a Monday show. And uh, to everyone who you know complains about everything, how do you like us now? You're going to miss us a hell of a lot more, all right? I can guarantee that. Um, but it's a, uh, it's a little break for uh, myself and the crew, and then we'll be back. A lot of shit going to happen, by the way, by the time you guys say goodbye on, on Monday, the 21st of August and September 6th. I mean, that Singapore card is actually quite good. The one coming up next weekend, well, not this week, like this weekend is Boston, but next weekend, Holloway, Chan Sung Jung, Anthony Smith, Ryan Spann, Giga Chikate, Alex Caceres, Aaron Blanchfield, Tyler Santos, Junior Tafa, Parker Porter. I mean, it's a damn good card especially for uh, Singapore. And then the one following that is Cyril Gan, Sergei Spivak, Mano Fioro against Rose Namajunas. That's the one in Paris. It's a lot, man. Uh, that 5 a.m. start time for fight. Singapore, too. Sign me up. Oh, Jesus. Uh, yeah, Usyk against uh, Daniel Dubois in a stadium August 26th as well. So there's just a lot going on. And a lot will have happened. The, the game will change. The next time I'm hosting this show... We'll be three days away from Izzy versus Sean Strickland. That's insane. That's crazy. <laughs> see you then, man. Yeah. See you then. My most uh, anticipated fight of the year. Uh, I mean, it's going to be fantastic. Yeah, uh, it's going to be great. On Monday. Hopefully, I'll talk to you guys then. If not, I'll be watching, listening, downloading, all that stuff and more. Uh, Frank, we could say goodbye now. I told the guys, we got to go till 4 today. 4.37. <laughs> Actually, Monday's show was shorter than this one. Didn't we have love to be. It. Oh, we love it. I love it. I want some more of it. Uh, but a great day was had, and I am excited about 292 at the TD Garden this Saturday night on pay per view, of course. Aljamain Sterling, Sean O'Malley, Zhang Wei Li, Amanda Lemos, Ian Machado, Gary, Neil Magny, Damon, Blackshear against Mario Bautista. Marlon Vera against Pedro Munoz, Chris Weidman, Brad Tavares, Gregory Rodriguez against Dennis Tuyalin. Nailed it. Austin Hubbard, Kurt Hollibaugh, Brad Katona, Cody Gibson. Shout out. Tough. Andre Petrovsky against Gerald Mearshart is on the early prelims. What the hell? Andrew Lee against Natalia Silva. Karine Silva against Marina Moroz. I mean, that's a solid pay-per-view card, top to bottom. A little something for everyone. I can't believe Petrovsky's that low. What the hell? Why is Petrovsky that low? They should have put him on the uh, main card. It wasn't like it was the featured prelim fight on ESPN. They never bumped that one up. But that low, that is a bit surprising. Maybe they'll change it. I'm looking at some dodgy website here. Uh, thank you very much to the aforementioned Andre Petroski. Uh, good luck to him this Saturday. Incredible story. Easy to root for him. Uh, good luck to Shane Burgos next Wednesday. Thank you to him for his time as well. Thank you to Tim Welch. Good luck to the team. And of course, thank you to Demetrius Johnson, Mighty House, a.k.a. the GOAT himself for stopping by with such great stuff. Back on Monday, same time and fights until I say... Peace.